Good evening, good afternoon, or good morning, wherever you are in the world watching right now. A very warm welcome to the UCI Cycling Esports World Championships on Zwift. Tonight marks the third running of the Cycling Esports Worlds, but there are some very significant changes when compared to the first two. Here with me in the studio to go through the favourites for tonight, that brand new format, potential tactics, etc., are Nathan Guerra and Hannah Walker. But before all of that, firstly, how did the riders get here? How did you qualify for this World Championships? Yeah, so Zwift, they put on an open pathway qualifiers. In order to get to these uh, qualifiers, you had to do a couple of community races in order to figure out who exactly that we wanted there. And then from there, there were three regional qualifiers that you had to be placing in, very similar in this kind of knockout series that we've seen uh, in this World Championship. Very similar format to make sure we're getting the right athletes for this World Championship. So anybody in the whole world was able to get involved in that, qualify for that, and then qualify for a World Championship from their homes. I love that part of this because you can do that for the World Road Race Championships, for example, but in general, particularly with the bigger nations, Hannah, it is those nations that they take the best riders, obviously, and the bigger names, but sometimes your face doesn't fit. Whereas with this, if you're good enough, you've got the equipment at home, you could potentially be at these world championships, and some of them are. And they will be, and they're given that opportunity to be here representing their nation at an eSport World Championships. And as you say, for those who are representing a, a UCI professional road team, it's very likely that they'll go to a Road World Championships, mm. whereas this, you can secure your place uh, outright in the continental qualifiers as we, as we saw back in November or the Federation will notice your name popping up week upon week in different and various Zwift races and think well we want that, that rider male or female within our squad because we know they're the best Zwift racers. Yeah it makes it very open and accessible doesn't it? Does. it? Uh, just a few moments time, you should see a rider gallery on the screen behind me. Uh, what you'll notice is that most of the competitors tonight, and the men's race comes first, are in their homes. But not all of them are. There are a few venues around the world where we've got multiple riders competing tonight, including Glasgow. Uh, not competing there, but there to present for us is Manon Lloyd, and she's going to give us an idea now of the atmosphere that's taking place there in Glasgow, and indeed of the equipment that the rides are using. Welcome to the Engine Works here in Glasgow, where eight out of the 173 riders taking part in the UCI Cycling Esports World Championships are going to be battling it out in front of a live audience, who will no doubt be giving lots of motivation and cheering the riders on this evening when the racing starts. But we also have some cycling royalty in that crowd as well. Sir Chris Hoy is here too, and we will be getting to chat to him in a little while. But if we just flip around now, these are the stages where the riders are going to be battling it out. We've got the females on this side, so we've got three women from GB and one from France. And then on the male side, we've got one from Ireland and three from Great Britain. Now, the men are just starting to warm up as their race is fast approaching. But I thought I would just quickly take you through the setup that the riders have here today. So every single rider from, that are taking part in this competition throughout the world have been sent a Wahoo Kicker V6. So it's a very level playing field, all on the same equipment. But here they also have the Kicker Headwind as well. So that's a fan, and I'm sure that's going to be turned up to the max because it is going to get very hot and sweaty in here once the racing begins. They've also got the screen in front of them as well, and that's where the Scotland map will be, where the right race will take place. They also have that blue power button, which is going to be very important when it comes to activating that power-up. And then above the rider, they also have their name and they also have a screen which is being mirrored so everybody here in the audience can keep an eye on the racing. They also have a little headpiece in so they can hear team tactics and everything that's going on. But let's just pop over here and chat to Richard Barry from Ireland. And Richard, this might be a completely different setup to what you're used to. You're not, you know, in your garage or in your bedroom, you've got quite a lot of people watching you suffering today. How do you feel about that? Uh, quite excited actually, it's, it's, it's great to have our sport at this level, being showcased at this level, but a little bit intimidated as well because there's pressure probably on, on all of us to try and squeeze in that top 30 for race one, but at the same time it's just so exciting. I mean the energy off it, we're sure we need to get a few extra watts from that. I'm sure you will, I'm sure the crowd will give you lots of energy to get a few extra watts out, but how do you feel about having you know, some of your rivals right next to you there? 
Um, it does change the dynamic a bit because not only can you see them on the, on the screen, you can, you can look at them, you can say, are they really suffering? Are they changing gears? Is it a real attack? So it does add that extra element, having them right here next to me. Well, good luck. I'll leave you to your warm-up. That is the scene set here in Glasgow. The crowd is ready, and it's going to be some fantastic racing. But back to you in the studio. Thank you very much to Manon. We'll be hearing more from her later on this evening. Uh, she mentioned there that all the riders in Glasgow are on the same Wahoo Kicker V6, and that is the case for every single competitor around the world tonight. Uh, that's one of a number of things that have been implemented by the UCI and by Zwift to make this competition as fair as it possibly can be. Right, I think it's about time that we explain to you this brand new format for today's racing, one that I am incredibly excited about, one the riders, I am sure, are incredibly nervous about. This is how our world champions will be decided very shortly. The eSports World Championships is entering its third year and it's had a big shake-up. Gone is the single race where the first person across the line is the winner. Instead, there are three shorter races that act as gradual elimination, removing the weaker rides until only the strongest and most tactically astute are left standing. Races must fight for survival until there's just three remaining one of whom will become world champion. The first event of the three is the punch at 14.2 kilometers long. At the world champs, the first 30 riders across the line will progress to the next race. The remaining 70 will be eliminated, heading for an early shower. The next race is the climb, just 8.6 kilometers long, featuring two climbs. The finish line will be at the top of the second. In the World Champs, 20 more riders will be eliminated. So there are two power-ups on offer at the Zwift World Champs. The first one is the burrito. Yeah, the second one is the anvil. The burrito makes you undraftable for 30 seconds. Yeah, and the anvil makes you heavier, meaning you're going to descend faster for 30 seconds. The final race is the elimination. As if enough riders haven't been eliminated already, the last rider will be eliminated from the race twice every lap until just three remain to fight it out for the order on the final podium. All I can think of whenever I hear that format explain it is just, ouch, this is going to be very painful for the competitors. Uh, one slight co correction, as I say, the burrito power-up is actually only going to be useful for 10 seconds as opposed to 30. We're very interested to see how the riders deploy it. Right then, let's take a look now at the first of the three rounds. Uh, instantly, all of these rounds are taking place on a brand new Glasgow world on Zwift that they designed specifically to host these world championships. But in that first round, which is called the punch, the riders head out to Breakaway Bray, and that is where they will pick up that burrito power-up. After that, they'll head back through the start line and then continue in a clockwise direction, eventually getting back to Breakaway Bray, which is where the finish line is located. Distance is 14.2 kilometres, and there's just over 100 metres of climbing, so it's going to be very fast indeed. Right then, Nathan, Hannah, let's talk tactics. Uh, first up, how do you see the burrito being deployed and used in this race? It would be really interesting because this is the first time in a World Championships where in this first race, everyone will have the same power up. It's not like previously in, in other World Championships or other Zwift races where it's completely random. The fact that everyone will have that same power up, the burrito, which they'll get in the, uh, the first arch after 5.1 kilometers of racing. And that'll be the only one. So tactically where to use it will be really interesting knowing that you've got one chance mm. um, and the fact that it makes everyone around you undraftable it also makes you undraftable from anybody in front of you as well so it's going to be very interesting as to how riders deploy that power up yeah i can anyone afford to wait for the sprint i'm sure some people will nathan but will we see riders going early on this one i think you kind of have to if you made into this world championship through a qualifier through say a climb right so one of the regional qualifiers were a climbing race well you might not have the quite of the punch in that final K or so. So I think we're going to see some riders that know that they cannot go match for match when it comes to the pure sprinters on this uh, breakaway break. Mm. So they're going to maybe try and give it a little bit early. Also maybe tactical for some of the natures, uh, nations that have some more depth that they're probably going to try and send some riders to soften up the pack a little bit. Tactics are going to be so interesting. It's such an unknown, isn't it, for us, but also for the riders taking part. 
All right, well, just under five minutes to go until the start of the men's race. Nathan is going to head up to the commentary box, can't figure out which camera I'm on, uh, to join Matt Stevens up there. As he does so, though, we're going to take a look at some of the favourites for the men's race. Uh, here are a few names that we think are worth watching very closely. First up, Freddie Ovet of Australia on great form recently. In fact, he posted a sprint video on Instagram where he was sustaining some insane power for a very long period of time. Jason Osborne of Germany, the only former world champion racing in the men's event today. We have Lionel Vuyasin, as one to watch for Belgium. Not had the best of results recently, but great pedigree on Zwift. I've also picked out Sam Hill, was incredible at the Zwift Academy finals back in 2021. And finally, we have James Barnes of South Africa, my pick, and also that of Cy Richardson's in our preview show. Uh, one rider, though, we haven't got on that list, but who will probably be the most familiar to those of you who normally watch road racing is Victor Campenart. I caught up with him in the week to get his thoughts on today's race. I'm a big fan of esports. I'm a big fan of uh, riding on, uh, on Zwift. I have the feeling it also makes me very strong. And it is like everybody knows riding three hours indoors uh, is way harder than riding two, three hours outdoors. And are you in it to win it, do you think? My main goal is, and I would be very, very happy if I can survive the first round. Uh, there's uh, actually not uh, one cell in my brain that is thinking about the fact that I would make it to the third round. <laughs> what do you think about the new format with the three rounds as opposed to just one race? I'm quite happy because in the way my training schedule was built up, I had to do two times 20 minutes, very, very hard efforts on this day and that's why it was really easy to conv convince my coach to do this world championship i won't be at home and i'm racing in a hotel and i will um i'm struggling to find the best way to plug in a, a ethernet cable to find the most stable internet uh, and this is my main worry at the moment uh, while at home i have my my uh, trainer uh, zip tied to a, a a big plate on the ground and I can sprint all out on it. Basically, you just need your uh, your trainer, you need a, a good fan and a lot of drinks. Uh, that will be the most important thing. He's such an entertaining character, Victor Campanarts, isn't he? Uh, what did you make of him saying that not even one of his brain cells is thinking about getting to the final of the three rounds tonight? Is he uh, is he playing with us or is oh, it just I'm, how specialist it's become? I'm, I'm wondering, is he playing with us, trying to downplay his chances to try and take a little bit of the limelight away from himself? I mean, we know what a, a strong, incredibly strong rider he is and he, he does love a breakaway, loves a time trial, so potentially could go for that in uh, in race one. Uh, but you, like you say, Dan, he's such a character, that the way you're saying there, well, hopefully for him, he does have stable Wi-Fi connection being yeah. in a, uh, a race hotel. But I think it is becoming quite a, a specialist race. And I think that's the beauty of this World Championships across the three different races that I think yeah. it really is going to suit as with specialists as we and see we everyone starting there. to warm We're up. Very stable internet connection so far, so good. All uh, right then, well the riders should now have completed their warm-ups and are now spinning their legs in the pen ready for the start of round one. So it's time now for me to hand you over to our commentary team for the men's races. Uh, it's Nathan Guerra, but first up we've got Matt Stevens. Thank you very much indeed, Dan. Welcome to Glasgow. This is it. This is race number one of a very new look World Cycle Esports World Championships. Um, I cannot wait to see how this unfolds, I really can't. Nothing quite like it, this brand new format, it's really gonna shake things up. I think we're gonna be treated to some of the most exciting, explosive, intense, stressful, but more importantly, entertaining racing for our spectators that we've ever seen on the Zwift platform. Alongside me, Nathan, this is, we, we've commentated for a long time, especially yourself, on, on eSports, on, on Zwift. This is revolutionary, isn't it? And, and I think this is the way forward, but it's unique. It, it offers up a unique proposition physiologically and psychologically as well, doesn't it? Yeah, it's extremely unique because this whole format that we're doing, this kind of knockout format, is very new, I think, when it comes to the world of cycling, for sure, especially being on a virtual platform. I do think that this is the way forward, though, uh, the, new, the new format. We've seen it very successful in the Zwift Grand Prix, which Zwift has been putting on. A lot of these racers have been extremely successful in those new formats that they've been testing 
testing, actually. And we've seen the community actually put on a lot of races like this recently to get prepared for this World Championships because it is also new to some of these racers. So the last six months or so, we've seen so many new uh, community races, Zwift races that they've been putting on themselves to get these athletes ready for this new format. Indeed. Well, here we go. The riders have rolled out the pens. Unsurprisingly, we've got some big power already being dropped down. Uh, as this is a World Championships, as you can see, all these riders representing their home nations. 23 nations represented for the men. Uh, 26 nations for the, for the women. We'll have the first three rounds of the men's race, and then we'll have the women's afterwards. But already, we've got a couple of riders off the front. There's Jason Osborne on the right-hand side there for Germany. Um, the former world champion, of course, Olympic medalist at rowing, now rides at world tour level for Alpersing de Koenig, and he's one of the riders, riders I expect to see up there. Well, the first power-up comes at only 5.1 kilometers in, but so far all together, but we estimate, Nathan, don't we, that this race is gonna be run between 17 and 19 minutes approximately. So really short and intense. And a reminder to everybody, only the first 30 riders will qualify for the next round. Yeah, and the thing is, I'm not sure, right now, it's all about jockeying for position. I think that's really what's going on with these riders at this point, because this Rolling Highlands course that we're calling the punch in this World Championships, this section through here, uh, the postcard section, as we go past the, the nice castles, beautiful scenery through here, it's kind of rolling down hills into this misty forest. And then once they hit that misty forest, it's going to be the first time up the breakaway bray. The second time they see the breakaway bray is actually going to be the finish line. Exactly. So that first little kicker, though, I think that's the first opportunity to really test the legs on any of the athletes. Up until we hit that point, unless somebody really wants to make some sort of a rolling move through here, we might not really see too much action till then. Yep. Absolutely fascinating stuff. So wonderful as well to see all of these uh, World Championships jerseys, uh, national champion, well, sorry, national jerseys, should I say. Great views of Scotland here as well. This world completely inspired. Ben Russell, the British rider on the front, is it kicked off the front. There's 6.9 watts a kilo, laying down the power. Quite clearly, Nathan, wants to try and establish something as early on. That's been shut down by Bjorn, uh, Bjorn Andreessen very quickly. Chris Dawson also accelerating clear. One of the Americans, Timothy Rugg, now gone clear as well. This is an interesting early move. Yeah, Timothy Rugg's really well known for this, and I think Timothy Rugg is one of these athletes that wanted to see something sort of a launch pad, and that was essentially just provided for him by Ben Russell. Ben Russell to be the first one to ramp the power up, get that speed going, but Timothy Rugg, he is so well known for these breakaways because he does not have that kind of kick. Going into those 15 to 18 watts per kilogram that they're going to need to get involved in the end here, it is not, not his forte, and he's almost publicly said, I'm going to go ahead and throw it out there and make sure that I'm, I'm noticed in this race because at the end of this it's going to be all about the kick exactly well that little group that coalesced has soon been brought back and there's the drop zone so some really nice graphics just to give you a clear indication of where these riders are on the road the bunch is still all together but the riders in the drop zone just there well three the ones in green up to 30th place there the riders who will currently stay in of course but we've still got around 12 kilometers to go 11.4 to be exact as we meander our way through this beautiful scottish world um, it's not an exact replication of Scotland, but what it does, it takes some beautiful features and obviously is a celebration of the upcoming World Championships in the middle of the year, which is going to be this once, well, it's, a, it's an enormous celebration of cycling, but great to see we've got a unique world created solely for the Esports World Championships. Yeah, and I love what you said there, Matt, because they're pulling from the world of Scotland everything that they could use for a race course. Yeah. That's really what this is about. It's actually an event-only world where you can only get into it currently with events and so it's all about racing actually out on this course that's what it was designed for it was specifically di designed for the world championships so they're pulling features you would generally find in scotland and throwing it into this race course and really if you haven't gotten out there checking it out it's, it's so great it, the it? kind of stuff they put out there yeah i've uh, done a couple of rods already here we're going through the misty forest as you can see almost like we're going back in time um, some leaves on the road there. Everybody jockeying for position, though. 10.5 k's to go. The first power up comes at 5.1 kilometers into the race. And as Nathan was just pointing out earlier on, that is our first ascent up breakaway Bray. The climb itself, it's only short 600 meters. As we see another attack of that Sam Hill. Interesting that he's trying things early on as we look at the stats there of one of the most well-known riders here, Victor Campanarts. I wonder will, if he will get through to the next round. But I can see his concern because I can see why he's nervous because this isn't, we've never had anything quite like this as we look at Campanarts there. Lovely headband, looking calm at the moment. 
He is. Now, Sam Hill, this little bit of a kick off the front is interesting. How is he trying to set something up here, perhaps for the Australians? What we were talking about in the pre-show a little bit there is that we may have riders that are looking to soften up the pack. You know, his uh, countrymen, we've seen really great results for them in past world championships. And Sam may be one of those rabbits they're putting out there to make other people kind of waste their carrots here and make sure yeah. that they lower their power levels, maybe for a little bit later. So interesting that Sam gave it a go. Now we are seeing a couple more making their way to the front, though, they're going to hit that first breakaway break right now. Here we go, just went through the red marker just at the bottom here. It is a, I'd say it's a, it's a complicated climb because look at the stats, 600 meters at 4%. You think that's nothing much, but it maxes out at 14. So it's, a, it's a, the sort of climb where timing is absolutely crucial. This is that little steep kicker at the bottom, then it flattens out, and over across the line, as we see Rugg go off the front again, maybe suggestive of, some of the United States tactics here. We'll talk a little bit more about the tactics once they've rolled through, but Rugg off the front, now de Kock rolling through for Belgium. Belgium have a big team here, one of the largest squads, in fact. The United States have 11, Belgium with nine, so two of the deepest squads in terms of options available to them. Really interesting here, Matt, that no one is really given much of a go. We are we see Victor Campanuts here off the front at 5.2 watts per kilogram, though, and as you can see in the upper right-hand side of your screen here, that's not really anything to you know get too excited about, which tells me that this pack is calm and waiting yeah. for the final case. Now, there is quite a ways to go. They're going to do everything you just saw the other direction in just a moment, and there is a lot of opportunity on the actual full lap proper of this rolling highlands. So I have a feeling we may see a couple of moves after they take a left-hand turn here and make their way through the lock, uh, which is a little pass that they make to make a figure eight through here later on. So left-hand turn, right-hand turn into that misty forest. From there on, I think there might be some bets off to try and make some moves, but if there aren't moves through there or the section, which is the postcard, I think from there on out, everyone's going to be waiting for the sprint. Exactly. It does seem to be quite tentative here, doesn't it? It seems to be there's a lot of riders just waiting and biding their time. You said it. You called it at the top of the show or even before we came on air when we were discussing what the, the various permutations might be today. It's either going to be super fast and furious or tactical and everybody just waiting to the end. But looking at the teams here, the riding for, 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 their, for their national squads, how much of an element of team tax, tactics do you think will be at play? Some, some riders are here on their own, others with really deep squads. How much do you think um, in such a short event can tactics play a part? Yeah, we had a, a little bit of interview uh, on a podcast this past week with uh, one of the DS's, Matt Gardner. And he, with the USA team, they've got a lot. He said that they've got a lot of depth. And getting in the work together was actually not that difficult. Other teams, though, it might be every man and woman for themselves a little bit. So it really matters a, a lot as to how much organization they're going to have within the team as well. And whether or not they are completely just riding. I mean, at the end of the day, though, really, Matt, you look at this uh, sprint at the end, and it really is what can you do when it comes down to that last minute or so, isn't it? So you can try and send some off the front, but with the amount of landscape they have to work with here, as you can see, it hasn't really softened things up too much. It hasn't, and it is such an unusual format as well. I mean, the riders have had opportunities to ride this in-game. There's been several events. Turek has now just floated off the front. Uh, the only rider from the Czech Republic, but a very, very good rider. Good road rider. Daniel Turek is a journeyman rider. He's been around a lot, excelled on the road. As we're starting to see a little bit of thinning out, we're just coming through the forest now in the opposite direction, looping round. I tell you what, although we're not actually in Scotland, it kind of makes me want to visit Scotland. It really is absolutely beautiful. The incredible detail. If you do get a chance, please do hop on. Get in an event, even if it's just a look at this wonderfully rich world. First deployment there of the burrito. Yeah, we just saw the burrito being used. It looks like by Timothy Rugg actually trying to break things up a little bit there. And that was uh, used in order to re remove any draft at that moment for any of the riders around him within 2.5 meters. We are seeing Zach Near making his way to the front, but only at 4.66 watts per kilogram. Now we're seeing Jason Osborne, former world champion. This is a guy who's got the goods when it comes so to the line. Strong, so isn't strong, isn't he? Yeah. Now looking here, the burrito power-up being deployed again. So now we're starting to see these, and that tells me that the moves are starting to be made because the uphill starts to get a little bit sharp there. 2% gradient. It does roll a little bit here. They could carry speed. This is going to be Led Laverick. And at 12 watts per kilogram here, Dave, that's, that's no joke. Yeah, that is, no, that is a commitment. That's not floating around. Laverick has just floated off the front here, but he's been joined by Rick Ottima. Ottima, one of two riders from the Netherlands here. 
that's just rolled through. We've got two riders clear, and these are two riders that could, well, if they get together in tandem and work well, they might open up a little bit of a lead to one and a half seconds. Andreasen trying to get across the gap here. Bjorn Anderson, they're nine watts per kilogram. As you can see, he might be looking to go across. They get three working together. This may work at two, 1.5 seconds. They've got the cap where there is no draft in the main longer. And Ed Laverick, Matt, Ed Laverick is exactly the kind of athlete that is going to want a breakaway situation, hope that nobody chases, hope that all they think about is the positions that are left and no longer think about the position he has taken up at the front. Laverick needs this in order to make it through, in my opinion. Yeah, I think you're right. Laverick who wants a hard, attritional race, doesn't want any of this uh, finessing, doesn't want a tactical race. He wants to make it as hard as possible, or at least get in a group. Even if you get in a group of five or six off the front and you get, you've, you've qualified for the next round, a reminder, again, this is an elimination rate. It is a race. It is a brand new format, 5.6 kilometers to go. And we have a little group off the front, the very experienced Rick Ottomar rolling through, Samuel moving through there for Canada as well. Um, so these couple of riders have got a second and a half off the front. Jeffrey Miller of France leading the chase behind. Yeah, and this is really interesting because, Matt, the reality is here is that those riders that have that same worry in their head as Ed Laverick has of knowing that I just don't have that kick in the end here, they're going to want to get across right here and right now and make this breakaway succeed. And we saw him going at 8 watts per kilogram, Jeffrey Miller there. That was definitely something. I even saw 11 watts per kilogram one moment. He was trying to bridge and not bring people across, but it looks like the pack has responded and it's all back together. I'm not sure we're going to see another one of those anytime soon. I know. Well, Turex tried something oh. just at that moment. Daniel Turek, again, a rider who likes an attritional race as well. He'll, which he certainly won't want to leave it to a sprint, but there are, we talked about it briefly before we came on air again. I think it's worth touching on it. The first 30 qualify, do you think there's some riders with enough condition, with enough confidence, with enough understanding of this course to just ever so slightly undercook it to save energy for the ne next round? Or do you think they've got to go all in? definitely some really experienced riders that are in here that are going to be saving what they can. They just want to finish in that 20 to 15. They don't, they're don't. they not thinking of winning this one outright first across the line. That's not going to be their goal. Their goal is going to be able to save as many matches as they possibly can, know the Zwift craft, know how to position on the course, and use their kick as much as they need to. Now, how much do you want to risk? That's the other question. Now, there's a breakaway here. This is the last opportunity, and there is a pretty sharp downhill after this, and with the in-game dynamics, a lot of times packs that are this large they're gonna roll right up on you like an avalanche so yeah. if they do not succeed here with it with only four kilometers to go and a massive sprint for a world championship coming up real quickly here I'd be really surprised if we see another move unless it's one of those 1k 1.5k like sure. Hail Mary's that's all we're gonna see from a after this was well, Stian Leveson on the front there for Norway Laverick goes again Definitely wants to try and pull something clear. And a little group of five riders there. Norin, Andreasen, Turek and Laverick now move clear. Three seconds is the gap. It is Travis Samuel and a couple of other riders trying to bring them back. The gap opens up a little bit, but Laverick is trying to make this as hard as possible, forcing people onto the defensive with 3.9 kilometers to go now. Good little move here by Laverick. He's clearly feeling good. Yeah, and I just want to really highlight here the way that these riders are under pressure, the kind of effort they are putting out right now. Not just Laverick, but those that are at the front of the pack as well. Laverick's currently pushing 420 watts, 186 beats per minute, 6.5 watts per kilogram. That is a massive effort. I mean, yeah, look at his face. It's that. absolutely suffering right now. And even at the front of the pack to bring this back. But Dave, I mean, excuse me, Matt here, four seconds. Uh, it's pretty that's far a, that's, out. That's a nice, yeah, it's a long way to go. But like sustaining that for the next three and a half K, pretty much impo impossible there. But we're doing good here. Leverson, Turek, Miller and Laverick now with a little bit of a gap. Travis Samuel of Canada trying to get across the gap. That great shot there. Giant Scotty the squirrel on the top of the screen there. This is a good little move. There is the rest of the pack. They've got him in the crosshairs. 3.2 k to go. But on the approach to the finish this time, before we do go up breakaway, break, we've got a nasty little kicker before we drop down. So there's, there is a pre preliminary opportunity to try and go clear and maybe go long with about a k and a half to go. This is the corkscrew that's coming up here. It's and quite through, steep. Yeah, and through the corkscrew, this section is going to be interesting for this breakaway because it essentially creates a situation where everyone is 100% willing to use their effort. They're 100% willing to go with whatever the pack is doing at that point, which is only going to ramp the speed up, actually, because no one's going to be reserving anything and caring about that because they know they have to give something to that. And that's going to essentially create a neutral chase, right? Absolutely. And bring these guys, most likely bring these guys back. Well, this is that little drop we just saw, Turek there, just dropping it into that super tuck, giving him a momentary bit of rest to tell you what you're going to need to conserve as much as you can on 
this course. We're just coming up to the aforementioned corkscrew. We go through and into the town, through this little fortress just on the right-hand side, but it does kick up. It's only very short, but it's quite a spiteful little climb. 2.2 kilometers to go now for this lead group, which have now got a lead of six seconds. This is going to be the telltale of the whole thing right here, Matt. The reality is, if they survive, they may be able to pull this off. They have to work together so incredibly well. We're going to be able to watch those watts per kilogram on the upper right-hand side of your screen. You're going to be able to see the matching of the pack or not. That's what I'm really watching for. How hard that pack's going to go. 12 watts per kilogram we're seeing from Michael Conzer. That is definitely going to maybe bring some of this time back, but they're holding on to five seconds here, Matt. This, oh, it's going to be diff right to the line if this is going to succeed, but if it does, that is six through. There's only 24 spots left behind them. Exactly. Look at that drop zone. These riders are riding well. They've still got a five-second lead. Victor Campanarch riding to the front. Lionel Vuyasa, one of the pre-race favorites here as well. Loads of ride-ons as well. If you're on Zwift and you've got the, the companion app, make sure you give these riders a ride on. This is race number one of the UCI Cycling Eat Sports World Championships from Scotland. And we're coming in very shortly to the final kilometer. This, Nathan, is where, this is where they really carried that speed into the, cl the climb. Two right with another super tuck there. They've got three seconds. Three seconds. I'm not sure it's going to be able to happen here. Matthew to talk on the front there. As you can see, six watts per kilogram. But the really, really smart, really well-known Zwift riders at this point are going to be sitting in that pack right around 50th place looking for that roll through speed. They're going to make the catch at the most crucial time. It's going to be right within that 1K to go or so. And that is going to, I think, shut down everything for this breakaway. I'd be thinking about how to rest now if I were at the back of this breakaway at this point. But Ed Laverick is committed. But here we go. It's going to be a full gas sprint. Look like here, Matt, for these top 30 sprint spots. Look at this. We're just going to rise up. This is where the road flattens again, and it looks like that group are going to make contact with our brave five riders in front. So Leveson, Andreas, and Lorraine, Turek, and Laverick are going to be caught. Jimmy Kershaw on the front there. Victor Campanat said he wasn't going to make it, but he's at the head of affairs here. Lots of burrito power-ups being dropped as well, making it undraftable. This is it. We're heading up towards the top. It kicks round. gets very steep. We've got about 400 metres to go. We're then round the corner, and it flattens out. It's so Reiners for Heller, Bjorn Andresen, Martins, Osborne, the riders you think that would go through. Remember, the first 30 riders to qualify. Who's in the drop zone? That's the key thing we're looking at now. It looks like it's going to be the Norwegian that takes it on the line. But the most important thing is who is at the front? Messino is there. Ollie Jones is there. Havid is there. This is absolutely fascinating. Across the line. Osborne, a third across the line there. And that's it. That is your top 30. Ben Hill, one of the pre-race favorites, just inside. Teppo Lorio, another popular rider. Victor Campanart's out of the reckoning by just two spots. Well, wow, so much to pick out of that first, uh, that first race. Very, very tactical, Nathan. I know the riders are going to be exhausted. We are too. Well, you look at this, Matt. When we talked about the Zwift craft, we talked about the riders that really knew about how to place themselves perfectly. If we look at this, it looks like Teppo Loyal did exactly what he needed to. Freddie Ovid as well, 25th place. You're starting to see this, what you were talking about, Zach Neer in 20th. These are big names, big riders. Yep. Well, that was absolutely fascinating. As Ed Laverack just rolls across the line, he knew he wasn't going to be there in a big bunch kick, but he played his hand. Super exciting stuff. Let's pick over that and head back to the studio. Breathless, brilliant stuff. Crikey, that was frantic, wasn't it? We barely finished our burritos here in the studio, let alone the riders en route today. Lots of learnings, Hannah, from that first race today. Poor old Victor Campos. I mean, he said to us that he didn't think he'd get through to round two, certainly not through to the final, but he was close, wasn't he? But I kept saying to you multiple times before we came on air, I'm looking to see who finishes 31st or 32nd in this race because that is going to be heartbreaking. So close to going through, yet so far. Such heartbreak. One of the Japanese riders there finishing in, in 31st, Victor Campanart's 32nd. He was looking good for him, uh, Campanarts, into the final kilometre. I was thinking he's got himself in a real sweet spot here with a kilometre to go. And you saw how frantic it was. Oh, yeah, the, the group of six riders having the six-second lead. And then it all coming back together. And so much to take from that. But as you just said, Dan, the speed of that was exceptional. And I think on the women's side of things, they'll have been watching that race very, very closely yeah. to see how it all played out. Well, the speed of it's caught us out, hasn't it? We've got a lot of time to fill <laughs> before round two. <laughs> Thankfully for the riders, though, it does mean that they've got a little bit more time to recover between rounds one and two than perhaps they were anticipating. But I want to go back to that group that tried to break away. You know, if you don't have a really good sprint at the end, you don't feel confident that you're going to be in the top 30, 
it's kind of all you can do, really, isn't it? But when it doesn't work out, then you've got no chance at all because you've put all that effort into being up the road. And you're not going to have much left for the sprint. If you want to be in with a chance of making it into the second race and being in with a chance of the victory overall, you've got to be willing to risk everything in order to win. And I think Ed Laverack was a perfect example of that, that he made two attacks. The first move, he got a slight gap, it all came back together. Then he was in that main move of six riders and he put all these bags, uh, eggs in one uh, basket in order to make sure that he went through. And unfortunately, it looked like he'd uh, just missed out in, in the end. And you see how everything came all back together. But it's that confidence, isn't it? And I think going in with a, a strong... Mm game plan, tactic, uh, and word to your strengths as a rider. Yeah, interesting to see Mark Mading first across the line there. Uh, Nathan sent me an email a few days before this World Championships, and he was actually his favourite for the win today. However, you don't want to finish first in round one, do you? I mean, I know that's the safest place to be, but it also means that you've effectively put the most effort in of anybody. You have. He's burnt a lot of matches, but then does it mean now that the... The, the big cull, the big cut in the first round where it's only 30 going through to race two, perhaps the pressure's slightly off. You've got less riders to, to think about, but now it turns to the attention of race two where you think, well, I need to recover from race one, think about the process, not think too much about the, the outcome um, and where you're going to finish, mm -hmm. but also try and get a little bit of respite and recovery for the, the 10, 12 minutes that we've got between the yeah. two races. Well, Mark Maiden can at least call it a little win already. Can. I also noticed, actually, that James Barnes and Jason Osborne, two other pre-race favourites, were inside the top four. Uh, one rider that was 25th, I noticed, is Freddie Ovette. Interesting. Uh, we can see, I believe, the top 30 results now. Uh, there we have it. Mark Maiden first across the line. As I mentioned, Jason Osborne there in third. James Barnes in fourth. Any other interesting riders up there in the top 30 after a quick scan from you, Hannah? Um, Teppo Lorio, the Finnish rider there in 27th, a very experienced Zwift rider. Also, Benjamin Hill. Really is. interesting to see how he goes oh. because he's an incredible crit rider. Um, he's, he's been up there in a lot of the Australian criterium, so a, a great scraping through there. Brad Gavarius as well, the rider from South Africa in 13th. Also an incredibly experienced Zwifter, as is uh, Vyas, and we've got Ollie Jones. Yeah, Great he's a former Zwift Academy winner, isn't he? Back in 2017 in uh, Cape Town, I think it was. I was over there when he was crowned champion. Gone back to a lot more Zwifting now. But yeah, let's focus on Freddie Ovette there in 25th place. Finished 1.28 seconds down. And Ben Hill, who you mentioned is another pre-race favourite there in 30th. I mean, Ben in particular, by the skin of his teeth, really. I mean, that could have gone either way for him. And you saw it's almost a photo finish, wasn't it, for that those those places of who would make it through to the top 30, who would um, unfortunately leave the, the World Championships there. So he, he's just about made it, um, but he has. Top 30 goes through, he's, he's made it through, and now he can start to focus on race two. But you see the, the time difference between uh, first and 30 there, two, two seconds mm. um, in, in, the, in difference. So a lot of power, a lot of energy used to yeah. try and take that victory. I've got to say, Freddie Ovette is looking very good, isn't he? He was one of the riders that we saw the cam of, that we saw him and he looked incredibly comfortable, as did Jason Osborne. But I just feel like with Freddie, given that he came 25th, given how solid he was looking, I think he was just very confident that he was going to be able to finish just inside that top 30 today. And in doing just that, just inside the top 30, save as much energy as he possibly could for rounds two and three that are still to come. It's that balance between the confidence and risk that you, you could go out and making sure... He, he clearly had everything well under control because when we did see him in his picture-in-picture picture and see just how confident and calm he looked and not overthinking the process. I think for Freddie, he knows he's confident that he's got an incredible one minute power. He's got a fantastic sprint on him. And if you see the way that he's been training over the, the winter period, basing himself um, sort of close to Denia, Calpe area, training with Remco Avenapol and, mm. and lots of other uh, road professionals, I think he's really put a big target on this World Championships. Yeah, definitely watch Freddie over there. I also found it interesting where the burritos were deployed. Quite early, I thought, but then afterwards I was thinking, well, if it's only 10 seconds, that power-up, you're kind of already sprinting with 10 seconds to the finish, aren't you? So I guess you have to use it a little bit earlier. And with, when you deploy that power-up, you don't gain 
any draft from those riders no. who are in front of you. So it's not just those who are behind you, but it means that you miss out. So I think for a lot of riders, it was best to get rid of the, get rid of the power up early mm. and make sure that they do have riders in front of them to draft come the finish line. So yeah, I wonder how many didn't use that power up at all over the course of the It would of be round interesting one. to see the numbers. No, yes. All uh, right, well, we are now going to hear from the most successful man in the short history of the UCI Cycling Esports World Championships. Winner in 2020, third last year, and he's back to try and retake his crown. Here's what Jason Osborne had to say when we spoke to him just a few days ago. How has your preparation looked? Because you haven't done as much Zwift racing as some of the other riders you'll be competing against on Saturday. Um, yeah, like, obviously, my main priority is... Uh is to be in good shape for the road races that are coming up. But um, of course we implemented some um, specific trainings. Uh, yeah, those punchy, those repeatability uh, efforts, um, which you really need in those races, uh, lots of short intervals, VO2 based mainly because that's yeah basically what it's all about in those shorter races. And yeah, the ability to, uh, yeah, to use lactate as a fuel and, uh, Sprinting, uh, practice some sprinting and uh, yeah. How much team tactics will there be? I really only think on the third race, really, there could be some team tactics. Like if you have um, maybe one or two teammates uh, at best, also under the top 10, then um, yeah, you can, you can work together really as a team and uh, make a difference there. But yeah, it will already be hard to have like one or two teammates of the same nation in the top 10. You're feeling confident? Yeah. Maybe the, uh, get that title back again, no? Former world champion Jason Osborne there, who incidentally, just a little while after that interview was conducted, did compete on Zwift in a very similar cut style of course, albeit not in the same format. However, he won all three of the races, so he's clearly on good form, not just on the road, but also on Zwift as well. Another thing you mentioned to me, Hannah, is that he's not at home. No. He's over in the UAE because he's starting the UAE tour on Monday. Yeah, yeah, I think he, I believe he had a travel day yesterday to the UAE and he's competing in in his hotel room, quite like Victor Campanazzi who's racing in a hotel room as well. So different environment, uh, it's something that you might not be used to. Of course, you, you're not um, used to the surroundings. But I think the, the, the good thing is perhaps his teammates are cheering him on in the hotel at the, in the UAE and also having staff members from his team of Alperson de Kerning. Yeah, I guess there is that, isn't there? But there is still, like you said, the stress of getting everything set up properly at home. Because when you are at home, everything's already there. You're used to it. You know what's there. You know what you need to have set up beforehand. But when you're going abroad, I don't know when he actually flew to the UAE, but it does add an extra stress factor, doesn't it? And I know we were kind of joking a little bit about it before with Victor Campanazzi and he was saying about his his Wi-Fi connection and it, it is something that you have to think about make sure that you've got a, a good connection make sure that everything's set up right make sure you've got a, a fan with you to keep your your core body temperature as cool as possible because we know how much the body starts to overheat when when mm. you're racing indoors you're racing on Zwift so making sure that you're trying to create an environment that you're used to just on, on another continent, a new time zone as yeah. well. And it's warm over there, it's not sweltering just yet. No. But I did suggest to Jason, I think, that he found a very big fridge <laughs> to compete in tonight. Uh, anyway, we're going to look forward now to the rest of the format and at race two for this evening. Uh, this one is called The Climb. It takes place on the city and school route. Uh, this, though, is not just one climb, but three all in the space of just 8.6 kilometers in distance. So from the start, the 30 remaining riders that we have in the race will pick up the anvil power-up and then find themselves almost immediately on that skewer climb. They then descend, turn around, head back up the other side before tackling the original side for the final time and the finish is at the top. Over those 8.6 kilometers, there is just over 160 meters of elevation gain. So it's going to be extremely tough. Uh, to remind you, only the riders who finish inside the top 10 on the climb are going to progress to the final. Uh, talk to us about the tactics that you're expecting for this event, Hannah. For me, this is a, as you saw there, it's only just over eight kilometers. It's the most amount of, of climbing that the riders will do at 161 meters. But for me, there's nowhere that you can really rest 
on, on race two, because even on the descents, you're always going to have to maintain your position to make sure that you don't lose too much by the time you get to, to the next climb. And the, the second climb that they'll tackle is, is very steep. You make that turn and then you go back up the skirt summit north. So a summit finish, those who will be, be used to, uh, and good climbers got mm -hmm. that good you know, one, two minute power output. Um, but I think, yeah, you, you can never rest on your laurels here despite it only being 30 riders going in yeah. into race two. Yeah, they're not long climbs, are they? But there's not, not much recovery between each of them. And it's where you use your, your power. You've got the, the anvil um, and it's only going to work on, on that descent. So you want to try and make sure that you use it to, 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 your, uh, to your advantage on the descent. Um, thankfully for the riders, it's not going to make them heavier once they're onto the flat. It's no, only I was on... a bit disappointed about <laughs> yeah, that. me too. I mean, I am the sort of person that takes... <laughs> pleasure? Great pleasure from other people's misfortune, yeah. So we have in the past seen a rider accidentally deploy the anvil before a climb, probably thinking they had a different power-up, and it adds 50 kilograms. But like you've just pointed out, in the instance tonight here at the World Championships, that power-up is only going to work, isn't it, whilst you are descending? It, it does mean that you, you can't get it wrong, which I guess, again, makes to, to a, a fair level playing field for, for everybody that you're not just going to shoot out the back of the, uh, the 30 riders by deploying it at the wrong mm. time. Is this one where we're likely to see a breakaway survive to the line? I mean, if you're not in a breakaway on this one, only 10 riders going through, then you're going to have to sprint w really well at the end, aren't you, on the top you of the are. climb? And it's going to be those riders who potentially um, can't climb as well as, as the other riders who've made it through that might have to try something a little bit earlier, even if they gain three, four, six seconds on, on the others, just to give them that sliding room, that little bit of advantage. But as we saw, it certainly put the pressure on mm. those who were in that chasing group in race one. So it'll be, be interesting how the team tactics have have been given out as well. Yeah. Each federation has got two team cars, virtual team cars, within the race. So what tactics they've given uh, to, to yeah, the riders. Yeah, another part of it, isn't it? Well, you can see 25 of the 30 riders are there behind us. They've not had long to recover, but perhaps slightly longer than they were originally expecting because that first race, round one, the punch, was ridden at over 50 kilometres per hour average. They were not hanging around at all. Anyway, time to get back over to our commentators, Nathan Guerra and Matt Stevens. Thank you very much indeed, Dan. Uh, breathless stuff, the riders just warming up. Um, are they warming up or are they actually warming down and trying to recover? Or maybe a, bit, a little bit of both. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Hope you enjoyed race number one. And we have our 30 riders that have gone through. This is now race number two. It's called The Climb. It's short, and I can tell you, it's not very sweet. The world, we're in the Scotland world, of course, the route is called the City and the Segur. Three climbs of the Segur summit. We climb twice up the Segur Summit North, which is 1.5 kilometer at 3.5%, maxing out at 13, and then one ascent of the same climb, but from the south side. Parts of this climb as well have got gravel just to add to the complications, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a bit more detail. But Nathan, a breathless race number one, some riders we expected to go through, a couple really cutting it fine. Um, Freddie Ovet, 25th place, is he? Is he tired or is he bluffing? Was he flexing? We're t again, I don't know if you've got enough time to, to, to digest that, but we're off again. Um, they get the anvil very, very early on uh, in this race. That's Lionel Voyasan. Just as we go through the station, they get the only power up. These are our 30 riders that are left. And this race is short, only 8.6 kilometers. It's a great ride. But I was wondering if he was able to show up amongst a world championship type crowd and reproduce. Well, was he saving a little bit using his whip crap or did he make his just did he just make his way through? That was cutting it so close. It was Freddie Ovid as well as another twenty fifth. Yeah. Mark Martin, who's my pick for the win out here, he won that outright for first place. Was that just a flex or did he go too deep? No, absolutely fascinating stuff. Jason Osborne, just on the right hand side, the only former world champion, won the inaugural event when it was held in Watopia. We are now in Scotland, and very shortly we will be rolling up the climb for the very first time. And it's a complicated climb. We've talked talk us 
through the climb. I've ridden it, you've ridden it, these riders have ridden it, but they've not raced it. The previous circuit, they've had, had opportunities in Zwift community to race on it, but we've not seen an event. So the dynamics in a race, completely different again, aren't they? And a reminder, only the first 10 to go through to the final round, the podium. Now, they have had the opportunity to look at it. National Federations could put events on, but that doesn't mean that there were community sure. events that we really get involved in, right? Now, this, talking through the climbs here, this climb is definitely this this climb is definitely going to be uh, a rolling rolling type punch into a roller punch into a roller that's going to be the main thing that's going to be happening here this first time up is going to be a testing of the legs but it's going to be the other side downhill and back up it that's really going to be the crucial moments i think for these riders whether or not they're going to go full gas from bottom to the top here i am not sure i think it's going to be more looking at each other and waiting for those second two climbs yeah it's a twisty climb as well you can't actually see the finish uh, until just maybe 20 meters to go when you're looking and you're riding on this climb on the mat it loops around it really is a complicated climb uh, varying different road surfaces and of course, in game, when you're riding, when you're riding on that gravel section at the bottom, it does feel there's that extra little bit of drag that you would feel when you're riding in IRL on gravel. And the thing about this climb that that I found complicated, uh, that I think these riders will too, is the fact it's very uneven. There are steep pitches, there are shallow pitches, and actually the bit over the line is actually quite flat. So timing is absolutely crucial. But we're going up it for the first time now. This is Segura Summit North. There's Ollie Jones, former Zwift Academy winner, of course. Ollie Jones from New Zealand, looking comfortable. Always rides in that particular style, doesn't he? With that damp uh, towel around his neck. Gr great to get a look at this New Zealand rider. Nobody's launching one just yet. And this is where we've got another little bit of a gradient pitch. It really kicks up quite steeply here. Yeah, it does. Now, Ali Jones looking calm and collected here. And that tells you a lot about the riders are putting in a solid effort. It is good effort here, but it isn't anything that's really putting anybody under pressure. Everyone's watching each other at this point and just making sure they've got in the reserves when it comes time for the fireworks. So as you can see, they're really thinking about the reality that this pack is big enough on the other side that if you were to get a gap, if you don't bring enough riders with you, you're most likely just going to be chased down like we saw in the previous race with Laverick and that group that was off the front, that downhill, it avalanche and it brought them right back. These riders don't want to see that, so that's why we're probably not seeing fireworks off the front yet. 8% here. Good tempo being set on the front tier. This is where it just loops around a little bit. 9% flattens out again before kicking up, so a very uneven gradient, but nobody has launched one just yet. And these riders now with only 30, they'll be fully aware of the riders they're up against and maybe how they've got to think about their tactics. There's the drops on there. It's worth mentioning, we've got three Australians in here, Hill, Ovet, and Marwood, three Germans. We've got Jason Osborne, the former champion, Mark Madding and Martin Martins. Cup three Belgians, Vuyasan, Power, and v uh, Van Eckout. Unfortunately, we see Brian Duffy now with the hats on there, out of the saddle, going up midway through the pack here. Um, I'll list the riders as we go down the other side. I think it's worth mentioning, they've already picked up the anvil, which is going to make them 50 kgs heavier. When do you think that would be deployed? This time round or last time round? What do you think? Yeah, it's a good question, Matt. And I think that on this other side of the climb here, it's very risky to use it on this downhill. Although this downhill, the gel's making a pretty good a little bit of a yeah. punch into, this downhill is sharper. It is going to be sharper. It's going to be the sharpest downhill they have. So perhaps you could see an attack through with an anvil. Will that instigate other anvils? Does that cause this rolling extra 50 kilograms per 100 kilograms on That's the it. on the avatars? You could see that situation. We're about to find out right now. So power now on the front, dropping down. And that's the thing. If you'd agree with Jason Osborne, now he's uh, flown the coop. It's just uh, clipped off the front here. The former champion, now riding at World Tour level, of course, is reabsorbed. Nobody is out of the back of this group that I can see. No real surprise. Um, but uh, most countries are represented. One rider from Great Britain, that's Andy Nichols. Bradley Guveris is there for South Africa. Both French riders got through. Great riding by the French in Jeffrey Muller and Sebastian Avo. As you said, Tepo Lorio and Leandro Messino of Argentina also there as well. South Africa actually very well represented. We got Bradley Guevara there. We've got as well the very well known in the community uh, James Barnes, known as Barney. He's going to be out there, and he uh, we've seen him performing at such a high level recently. We've seen him in a lot of the Zwift uh, Grand Prix races, as well as Zwift Premier Division races, where he is able to make some breakaway situations. And for him to make it through his punch, we'll see what happens if he makes it up this climb. He'd be a favorite in that crit if he makes it through. Definitely. Well, what was interesting there, unless I missed it. I didn't see any anvils being deployed. It looks like everybody is saving it. Only one power up. They got it earlier on. 
before we uh, lost that uh, elevation. We're now looping round and we're coming back up the climb very quickly. So we had about one kilometre of flat and you can just see the red light on the left hand side indicating the start of the climb. This is climbing up the descent they've just been round. They've just done a little loop and now they're heading back in the opposite direction and it is Lionel Vuillassant um, on the front. And you can just see this kick, very steep gradients, low down. And this goes on for a while, actually. It's a slightly shorter climb this time, 3.1%, um, maxing out at eight. Osborne on the front, and he looks to be, at the moment, riding well within himself. So this, right now, is quite a tactical affair. It feels to me this peloton is almost like a virtually coiled spring right now. We are seeing Lorio now make his way to the front at 8 watts per kilogram. That's a little bit of a push. Now it is going to flatten out, so there's going to be a good draft to be used at this point. That's the steeper section that we just went through. Now they're going to go a little roundabout here and then see the uh, that finish banner, but it's not going to be the finish this time through. There's a nice downhill that's got a lot of chicanes that they're about to hit, and there is some dirt on there. Matt, we have not seen any anvil yet. No. Every anvil is going to be used on that section. <laughs> I mean, where else are you going to use it? There's no more downhill. No, but then the t then there's the timing, isn't there? Tempo Lorio, such a popular rider. Really is a solid, solid rider. Very, very aggressive. He's stolen a little bit of a march. He's opened up a gap of just 1.3 seconds now. But he's just about to be uh, winched back in. So it's the Rhinus Verhel of uh, Belgium there. Let's look at some other nations. Anders Voldega, Bjorn Andriessen, and Oscar Vid from Denmark. Three Danes in there. One Canadian, Jean-Michel Lachance. Two from Norway, Glednes and Vidar Mel. As you see, Vahel just moving clear now. 2.3 seconds. He's coming towards the top. There it is. They swing right, then an immediate left before they drop down the other side. Will he use an anvil here and make advances? This would be a good, good little bit of riding here. Remember, it is only the first 10 to qualify. One more ascent coming back in the other direction. 3.5 k's to go. And we have a Belgian solo. This is interesting. At five seconds, they really just let him go. He kicked up to the nine watts per kilogram for a moment there and then immediately opened up three seconds. Now it's onto the dirt section. You can see that They've got that little dust there going out the back. It means he is on dirt. And you can see perhaps an, an anvil is going to be used here because he will be able to get away more because of that increased kilograms and maybe equalize things out. That's one of the big things is the neutralization that that could create here. It's coming back, though. There's the avalanche we've talked here about. We there's go. the anvils. An avalanche uh, of anvils, a snowstorm of anvils on the descent of the Segur summit. Tepo Lorio drops through to the back. Look at the speed. Look at the dust there kicking up here in virtual Scotland. A couple of riders are really finding it hard to maintain the pace. Once you get gapped and out of the wind and they've got the anvils in front, it's so, so hard to make up the gap. Yeah, and you can see in the drop zone here a lot of names that we were not expecting to be out there. It's going to be Barney Anderson trying to get involved again. Brian Duffy Jr. at the back, but having to push seven watts per kilogram. What an effort just to stay involved in this race. Look at the roll through just now to the front. It's going to be Dawson. Chris Brilliant. Dawson there. Perfect timing. His anvil's gone now, but he used, he used a combo combination of the super tuck and the anvil at the same time just to steal a little bit of a, of a, of a march and now he's gone clear. Uh, Duffy, Medding, Andreasen all coming back together. Chris Dawson there in that Irish kit with a Yorkshire hat on or is it an Irish hat? Here is Chris Dawson picture in picture on the left hand side kicking out five watts a kilo and making it look he's like he's riding down to the shops looking very easy but there are you're pointing out on the screen here several riders have been caught out on this descent. It looked like it might be Tepo Lorio one of the community favorites off the back at this point. I saw Rhinus who sacrificed a lot over the top. He was off the back. Verhill was off the back there as well. They're going to have to make a chase back on. Those are crucial amounts of energy they're going to be using at the bottom of this 1.5k to go just to get back involved in this race. 1,500 metres to go. As you say, this is race two. Ten riders will go through. We had 85 riders started out earlier on. Only 30 went through to this round. This is the climb. And in 1,400 metres time, we'll have our ten finalists. There's already a couple of riders just off the back of this group. This climb ebbs and flows. They've already been up it once. They know it very well. 1,300 metres to go. Vidal Mel on the front there. Vuyasana not too far away. Jason Osborne, the former champion a couple of years ago, also in the mix as well. Ovet there, one of the pre-race favourites, hovering around the top ten. He won't be taking chances this time. It's too risky to flex it on this climb now. It's going to be all in to make sure you secure your place in the final, in the podium round. 1.1 k's to go. Yeah, we were just seeing a Canadian rider, I believe it was, that just got back on terms just a moment ago. I believe it was. It was, And they did slow down a little bit, kind of looking at each other at this moment just to make sure you're not wasting any effort into these final few kicks. They're going to start thinking about it's going to be the final 10th of the line. Now you're reserving to find out whether or not you can make the punch to be one of those first top 10. 
Let's look at the numbers. Nobody's moved into us. 10 watts a kilo there. There's a couple of riders just starting to move clear, but it's only a short kicker. Then ever so slightly downhill, back onto the gradient again. The judging of this climb is so, so complicated. They're still all together. Martin's on the front. He swaps with Osborne. Vuyasan is also in the mix. Ben Hill and Barnes. This is where the road kicks at 5%. We've got, uh, we're nearly coming towards the top here. We've got about 300 metres to go. It's all in now and to the finish. There's your 10 riders. Only 10 to qualify. for Messino now of Argentina. Is moving clear on the front. What a move this is. Messino has got some daylight. Vuyasan in second place, but it hasn't finished yet. The road will start to kick again. Big, big numbers. Riders being dropped left, right and centre. Maddig in second place. Ollie Jones, Brian Duffy is there as well. Who are going to be the top 10 qualifying riders? Well, the finish is just coming round 4%. Now, what a ride this is by Messino. Kel Power is there. Osborne, Dawson. This is it. This is the last roll for the line. Power coming across the line as well. It's just just over the hill here. It doesn't come into sight until the last few metres, but the former world champion Osborne making sure of his place in the final round. Power and there, there. Ovet also in the mix. What a ride there by Osborne. Well, breathless off. That's your 10 riders. There is your top 10. The riders below that have been eliminated. Wow, what an effort there. And I believe, does it seem that Messineal went too early there and was caught out at the line? We have our top 10. James Barnes makes his way through, as we saw there. That, that, Freddie Ovid, big kicks from them. That was an amazing last kick to the line. It certainly was. Well, Osborne, Nair, Power, Mading, Ovet, Vid, Lednius, Barnes, Andreasen, Foldager. Looks like... That's our top 10 subject to confirmation going through to the final round. Back to you in the studio. Breathless stuff. Next up, the podium. Oh, poor old Massimo. He was looking so good there. And I thought he'd just pipped a top 10 place after he was caught on the line, but it wasn't to be. He's outside the top 10. And of course, 20 riders were outside the top 10, Hannah. We'll be looking through the results very quickly, but... I noticed that Vuyasin of Belgium, one of our pre-race favourites on our graphic, he is one of the riders that was out. I know he's not had the best of results on Zwift recently, but he will be very disappointed, won't he now? He'll be incredibly disappointed, especially when you saw that he was coming over. He was in that almost drop zone, wasn't he? Eighth, ninth place, and then in the end, once the, uh, the results had settled themselves, uh, it seems he's, he's missed out. And whilst he's not had the best of results, he is one incredibly experienced Swifter and he knows exactly how to to race on this platform we know he's been around for so many years now but this was a a bold gutsy move from uh, Leandro Massinho here the the Argentinian who went early with around 400 meters to go yeah, it was a gutsy move. I would fully agree with you. And it felt like he really deserved to go through to the third and final round, didn't it? But he just went a tiny bit too early. You can see his power there was upwards of 12 watts per kilo when he made his attack. And at this point, when, when we saw the line in sight, Hannah, I just thought he's going to hang on for a top 10. But on to Jason Osborne. I mean, he took no chances there, did he, coming towards the finish line? Every time we see him on camera, he just looks so smooth and in control. When we saw his picture in picture and we saw him in his hotel room with the support of his his team there. On a bed. Was, <laughs> on the bed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah just relaxing. <laughs> He's great support. I like to see it. I like to see that camaraderie. But for for Osborne, he looked rock solid. He looked so in control. Just casually pushing out 600 watts without any uh, slight movement of his upper body. He's just, rock steady, isn't he? It's all that power going straight through the legs, straight through to the, the, the pedals and propelling himself forward. And you saw that acceleration from him to the finish line. And once he made that move, he was touching on 14 watts per kilogram mm. in that final 200 metres. It's exceptional. He is looking like the man to beat in the final, isn't he? But we've got 10 riders who have gone through to our third and final round. The World Championships will be decided between them. And here are their names. Jason Osborne with a quarter of a second time gap over the USA, Zach Nair. Uh, Kjell Power of Belgium through. Mark Mading uh, is also there in fourth place for Germany. Freddy Ovet took no chances this time. Halfway down the top ten for him. Uh, Oscar Klid, should I say, of Denmark in sixth. Harvard Yerdners of Norway in seventh. James Barnes of South Africa through to the final in eighth. And the final two qualifiers are Bjorn Andreasen and Anders Foldiger, both of Denmark. So three Danes 
and one Norwegian through to the final of the World Championships. Uh, looking down the rest, we've already mentioned Vyasin and a couple of others, Hannah, but any other big surprises of those that haven't made it through to the final? In looking through that list, Chris Dawson, the Irishman, uh, most... Um, would know him as Chris McGlinchey. He's not made it through. He was looking like he was in a really strong position throughout this second race, but unfortunately finishing down uh, just less uh, than three seconds down on Jason Osborne. Vidal Mel, the Norwegian, also uh, not making it through. Ollie Jones down in 28th and Tefa Lorio for, for his efforts earlier on. Mm. I think he really started to suffer and pay for those. He did, yes. It was a group of 29 of the 30 starters who hit the foot of the final climb together. Were you surprised by that, that we didn't see more attempts to go off the front earlier on in the race, that we saw it all come down effectively to that final climb to the finish? Well, I think a lot of the riders were playing to their strengths and not really wanting to take any chance. The fact that they knew it's going to come down to those those two climbs and if you're not really able to to get too much daylight we saw the the Belgian rider Renus only really get a, a handful of seconds and then he was reeled in so it, it, I think once you see a move like that the sole sole rider try and get away and it's not worked out that uh, leave it all down to mm. to that finishing climb and hope that someone goes early like uh, Messino did the Argentinian and draw the uh, the race out and almost put the sting into the other riders, yeah. forcing them to, to go long. Yeah, it was interesting to see the use of the anvils, as you were just describing on the descent there. I think Matt Stevens described it as a snow... A snowstorm, was it? A snowstorm of anvils, which are three words in a particular order that I don't think anybody in the history of planet Earth that's ever strung together <laughs> like that. But... They did all just fly up to the leader of the race there and straight past him. So again, I think you know, a lot of the female competitors will be looking very closely at this and how they're going to play things later on tonight. And I think this caught a lot of the riders out when the their competitors started to use and deploy the anvil because you see the gaps that were starting to open up and add in the fact that it's very difficult visibility-wise to see where your other competitors are because of that dust flying up in front of you. And this was the moment where Chris Dawson, the Irishman, started to get a little bit of daylight on the descent. Um, but I think that the, the women will be watching this closely they as will to be, how, won't they? how it all unfolded. They won't know whether to concentrate on their warm-up or to concentrate <laughs> on the racing action to get some tips for their racing well, later. Well, I don't know about, about them, but my, my heart rate's through the roof. Thinking, my who's, heart rate's who's been very high as well. going to make it through here? Yeah, like I said earlier, it's been almost in as intense for us here because it's so quick between the races. But great entertainment to have all these different races, you know, three rounds per race to decide the ultimate world champion. Your thoughts on it so far? I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying it. I think we're starting to see an all-rounder who has got the, the ability, not just physically, but tactically, who can uh, position themselves well, who's keeping themselves cool, calm and collected. I think it's a, a fantastic format because you're not just having to think about the climbs or the power-ups or where to deploy them, but it, I think it's a... It's an all-round test of is, a rider's yeah. ability. And the final one will be something completely different as well. Uh, only 10 riders now remain then, and shortly they will be back in action for the third and final round that will ultimately decide the world champion. I think we're going to go over though now and see Jason Osborne. Uh, here he is, over in the UAE, preparing for the UAE tour that starts this coming Monday. You can, of course, watch it on GCN Plus. Territory restrictions do apply. Uh, but he rides for the Alperson de Kerning team, who picks him up after his performances on Zwift over the years. As mentioned, he was world champion back in 2020 and then third in the event last year, the second running of the UCI Cycling Esports World Championships. Cooling vest on, Hannah. Very important yeah. over there. I was just thinking that. He's got his cooling vest on and... Uh trying to make sure that he can keep his core body yeah. temperature as cool as possible. We know how much that, that affects performance. So trying to, to keep that core body temperature as cool as possible going into the final round and uh, maybe checking out who had made the top 10 there on uh, his device. Yeah, probably looking at social media as well, see the rider's reaction yeah. to how cool he's looking. 
Right then, let's turn our attentions then to that final round, which aptly is called the podium. <laughs> the race is held on a hilly crit style circuit of three kilometres in length, which they will tackle four times. At least some of them will tackle it four times, because the cruel twist in this race is that one rider is going to be eliminated every half a lap. So that starts with the first elimination after just 1.6 kilometres or one mile. No easing yourself into this one. Uh, that first elimination line is on the top of the main climb on this circuit, which is the Clyde Kicker, and the second is at the Champion Sprint. And the Champion Sprint is also where the ultimate finish line is located. And that one, also, Hannah, is by no means completely flat, is it? It's not, and it's the run into the Champion Sprint, which you could get wrong as well, because it's a slight kicker with around 400 metres to go. You have uh, a left turn, starts to flatten out another left turn, and then you can see the finish line and I think for riders it's don't go too early mm. don't open up just because you can see the finish line don't waste uh, waste your energy and use your effort too too early against your yeah. competitors yeah, it is not flat I mean this graphic makes it look very mountainous it's not quite <laughs> as steep as it looks on that one but as I said it just goes to show that this although crit circuit is not a flat one so there are opportunities to go on the attack it's been quite cagey so far but you can't really afford to be here because you can't be in last position at any of the eliminations and and knowing that uh, every half a lap there's going to be that elimination and you can see um, how difficult the Clyde kicker is because it's in it almost ramps up in two parts and again you can see where the the back the arch is where you will be eliminated and on the second part of that climb you'll see max gradients of nine percent so it really is a, a bite you again you don't want to go too early but you also don't want to leave it too late to um, to make your move and feel if you do get eliminated that I actually had something more to give there I wish I'd just started to open up a little bit earlier yeah. so it's you don't want to be like Messino and just get caught out just no. on the line and be in last place do you uh, well hopefully the remaining 10 riders in this race have read the rule book intently unlike our very own Ollie Bridgewood here at GCN who thought it was one elimination every lap and not every half lap so he was the first person out in the final round of the three Right, the break for the riders is almost over, so it's shortly time for me to hand you back to our commentators. I think we in the studio are getting increasingly nervous, aren't we, yeah. as the rounds go on here. A world champion is going to be decided very shortly. Rainbow bands are going to be handed out, and so it's with great pleasure that I now hand you back to Nathan Guerra and Matt Stevens. Thank you very much indeed, Dan. I agree. I think we're all nervous. It's been absolutely brilliant so far. I hope you at home, wherever you are in the world, are enjoying it. This is the third edition of the UCI Cycling Esports World Championships, and this is it. This is the final race. It is race number three, held in the centre of Glasgow. This is the Glasgow Crit Circuit, four laps of just over three kilometres, 12.3 k's in total. And as was said before, two riders eliminated per lap. We've got 10 riders in the final. Freddie Ovet of Australia, Jason Osborne and Mark Mading of Germany, Kjell Power of Belgium, Andreas Voldega, Bjorn Andreasen, Oscar Vied of Denmark, Harvard Gledners of Norway, James Barn of James Barn, sorry, of South Africa, and finally represented the USA. It's Zach Nair. And that is the Clyde Kicker. Just chatting to Nathan about that one. You can see it all the way up. The other climbs we've had today have been almost out of sight. Maybe not quite out of mind, but that one, bang, dead center. They'll be purred. This is where you'll get your power up as well. It's the burrito. They're off. Um, first person is eliminated after 1,600 meters. Um, Get ready, get dialed. This is going to be electric, Nathan. Yeah, and I think we're going to get a lot of information right off the bat about who's still feeling pretty good. Who is able to ride those fifth, fourth, third wheels and just make sure they're in the right position and not get eliminated because the eliminations come fast and furious. And right from the get-go, Oscar Hovind makes a move. Is that, no, is it going to be Jason Osborne off the front? It's Anderson. No, it's Anderson. Excuse me, Anderson. The update's coming on through here. Marion, is he going to chase that down or is he going to say, well, go ahead and waste some energy. We'll bring you back on the descent. Yep. Well, absolutely fascinating stuff. We did talk about this. Um, riders perhaps going long on this circuit. If you don't trust your sprint, given the lack of recovery, given the fact every single lap over the 12.4 kilometer distance, um, 
you're going to be these real big surges of power, not much opportunity to recover. Why not try and go long? And Anderson's got a four second lead. And if he holds on for a couple of laps, he's in with a shout. So, really interesting tactic here. It is interesting. Now, my question is whether or not this can be brought back very instantly on that puncher of a climb there. You know, the Clyde kicker, Matt, is an extremely intense 20 to 25 seconds. And the way that they're going to be going over this with how many riders there are and how close it can be, I'm not sure they're going to be reserving a whole lot. So, I have a feeling that Anderson has to really open up a pretty large gap to stay away from the kind of a sprint they're going to be bringing over that first elimination. Yep, it is only a short climb, but you can see it all the way up. Max is out at 9%. This is the group behind Foldager, Vid, Osborne. It looks as if the three Danes, or the two Danes that are in the, in the group, just moving through to the front. Jason Osborne there, never off the podium in the Cycling Esports World Championships, a medalist last year and winner of the inaugural event. What an athlete he is now riding at World Tour level. Gedner's just behind. Yeah, we'll see the climb in just a few moments' time. But meantime, we're nearly at double digits here. Andreasen nearly has 10 seconds, 9.25. That, I think, is going to be looking good as we get through the first elimination point. Yeah, he's secured himself through this first elimination pretty solidly. I have a feeling he's maybe, most likely, going to come back on the descent with the kind of speed they're going to pull through here. The rest of these riders, though, what's on their minds? Not being last over the top of this first. Clyde Kicker, Zach Mir setting up at the back. Well, this is, I, I likened this, this format to like a digital omnium. It feels like we've got... We've clearly got one rider up. You can see the climb ahead. Great aerial shot of our riders. We've got around 200 meters now. This is where we've seen our first burrito that been dropped. This is the acceleration. Ovid goes just coming to the top of the climb. It's going to be Vid. I think Vid, Vid is going to be the first rider out the back. Unless he can, is he going to just roll Nair on the line? Oh, it's going to be close. I think Nair has gone. Or is it Vid? We'll get confirmation in a minute. Oh, wow. Oh, it's Zach dear. Nair. Wow, first elimination. Cries from my American to my right hand. <laughs> Side. We've got uh, one of our uh, United States friends has gone, and then there were nine. Nine riders now left in the mix. One rider off the front with a five-second lead, and half of his lead was slashed on that climb. One rider down, and very shortly, through the champion sprint, we're going to lose somebody else. And it comes up so fast, so furious at just at this moment here because it's just every half a lap. So now the initial kick, the, it's been opened up here at this point. They're gambling at this point and they're starting thinking, how do we position ourselves correctly? Because this next one is tricky. It isn't just an uphill kick kick. It's a left-hand turn with a little bit of a downhill with that elimination. If you don't set up correctly, you can just be a lead-out man for your own elimination. Definitely. Well, Andreasen is riding a blinder here. He really, really is. He's holding on. He's building the lead back up again as it settles down behind. So we've got one rider in front riding at a constant tempo, a very hard tempo, just under five watts a kilo, kicking up to six watts a kilo now. And he's got five and a half seconds on the group behind. It feels very, very tactical behind. Zach Nair, unfortunately, for the United States, is out. Next time through, the Abana, the champion sprint, we will lose somebody else. But almost we've got two races for the price of one. We've got a time trial and almost like an, a mini elimination race. So they're really backing it off and kicking up the power here. Yeah, they are. And this is going to be tough for Brian Anderson off the front here because he may eventually get caught. And at that point, how close is he going to be at the next elimination point? And can he reset enough to sprint? Will he have anything left with how much energy he's put out in front? It's a left-hand turn. Next elimination is within about 500 meters. Not even. Yeah, Jason Osborne, it looks like he's opening this one up there. Very, very long indeed. There's a burrito that's been dropped by Mark Madding. Barnes goes on the left-hand side. It looks like Osborne and Barnes are definitely going to qualify. It looks like Foldega is at the back, swapping it with his teammate, Havid. This is the back. It, despite the burrito, we're going to lose a Dane. I think it's going to be Oscar Havid who's going to be eliminated this time through the champion sprint. A clutch of riders, two Danes at the back, down to eight. It is Vid who is eliminated on the streets of virtual Glasgow. Eight riders left in the mix. Remember, only one race. Rainbow jersey. This is getting tense. Take a deep breath. We've done 3.5 k's, to, uh, 3.5 k's down. Andreasen looks like he might be caught. This is clearly costing him a lot of energy, but he's still in the mix. This is the reset moment for him, in my opinion. Stop just back off and get in that pack, but he's continuing on. This is interesting, still at 5.8 watts per kilogram. He is definitely still well into this effort with only 1.5 seconds. Is he trusting that they're gonna sit up a little bit? And they probably are gonna re reset at this point. What was very interesting though, what we just saw was the the burrito power-up being used by Foldiger actually made it so that he no longer had a draft on the pack, and you saw how the pack went away from him. And on top of that, Vid, his countrymen, couldn't draft him either. It Essentially, he kind of shot himself they, in the foot. They were best off not deploying it. 
They're exactly. totally best off not deploying it. It is a really nuanced power-up. It's a brilliant power-up, but it really makes you think, uh, well, you, you need to think where you drop it, exactly where you drop it, and the impact it's not just going to have on you, but of course the riders around you. Meanwhile, up this little bit of a drag, heading towards the lower slopes of the Clyde Kicker, Bjorn Andreasen has opened up more of a lead now, seven and a half seconds. This is good riding. Are we going to see a little bit of a coup, but we've seen how much time was taken by the group on the previous lap. It, they took the 10 second gap down to five in almost a heartbeat. There is the Clyde Kicker. We're looking at it from a different view. Accelerations are coming out. Osborne again leads, drops a burrito at the same time. Burrito power up. That means nobody's really going to get any kind of draft. 10 seconds to the top of this, most likely at this point. So it's just going to be mono and mono, man versus man at this point. Jason Osborne gapping himself a little bit at the back. It's going to be Geldine's now. Is Geldine's going to be able to come through? No, James Barnes, the South African, looks like he's going to be out. Out. It, James Barnes is indeed out, the South African. Such a popular rider. Really likable character here. But he is gone. We have now just seven riders left. Ovet, Power, Osborne, Gledners, Foldega, and Andreasen, who's still on the front. He is riding. Well, the thing is, he's riding this even effort. Although it's costing him something, what he's not having to do is go super, super deep. So he's riding at a completely different rhythm and style of effort than the riders behind. And clearly he's thought this one out because he was the first rider off. We're around about half distance now. He's got, he's, it, basically, his lead is shortening, then it's going out again. But are the others fully aware of that? They, they don't want to let him get out of sight, given 10 or 15 seconds, he could end up being the world champion. Yeah, could just ride away with this one. And if this rhythm that he has right here on this course, if he's kind of figured out some sort of rhythm here that he could get away with just enough seconds over and over again, we could have a complete upset. But he keeps coming back enough that the pack's going, we're going to bring that back. I think we're going to yeah. bring that back. But I don't know, Matt. This is playing with a little bit of fire here, in my opinion. Yeah, I'm just wondering whether one rider next time up the... Uh, the climb of the Clyde Kicker just carries on that effort through. Uh, as we get a more reduced group, I think there are a couple of riders here that have that sort of capacity. I'm thinking the likes of Jason Osborne, the likes of Freddie Overt, two of the standout riders uh, in esports right now. It is Madding who rolls through to the front. Look at this, 10.7 seconds. It's heading towards 11 seconds. It is indeed 11 seconds now. This is the largest lead that the Dane has had. There are seven riders left. Next time through, the Clyde Kicker, we're going to lose somebody else. Very tactical behind and proper double digits now for the Dane. This is very, very interesting indeed. 6Ks done, 6.3Ks to go. Fascinating. 13 seconds now. This is very fascinating. We've got our elimination coming up here real quickly, modding in a perfect spot, unless a burrito power-up does get used because there will be no draft. There's a burrito power-up. You've got to kick immediately to make sure that you're involved here. Modding at the back, you're going to battle with Ovid. This is really dangerous moment here for these riders. Are they going to be able to come on through? It's Ovid versus Modding, Modding versus Ovid. These are two of the favorites, but they're going to try and come through. It may be Mark Madden. It's going to get eliminated right at the line. Oh, it's power. It's, po oof. it's power. No, it's Glidness. That was such a late sprint. Wow. It is Harvard Gledners of Norway who is gone. Gledners is eliminated. Wow, there we go. It looked very close. I thought Freddie Ovet, well, it, it changed so quickly. It, it did. really, really did. But it's Gledners, he was out. And, but meanwhile, undeterred, it is beyond Andreasen at 10 seconds. So um, the way this race is unfurling at the moment, if he keeps on losing the time like he has, but then gains it, the net result, he's going to be further and further in front unless something changes behind, unless somebody goes over the top of one of these elimination points and tries to bridge across to him because he's clearly found, he's found his rhythm and he's riding well. It's not panicking, riding at 5.5 watts a kilo, but rides at this level, it is sustainable for the next five or six minutes. He actually gains two or three seconds exactly. every single lap here. Interesting enough, these riders really have to start thinking about whether or not they're going to kind of form a little bit of alliance here against the reality of Bjorn Anderson off the front, Jason Osborne. And we know he's got the power, Freddie Ovid. These are big names here. What are they going to do about the reality of perhaps a ride away here? 15 seconds, Bjorn Anderson may be our world champion if he keeps this up. And there it is. Martin says enough is enough and makes his way to the front. Osborne on it immediately. Or Ovid here, is he going to go across? Yeah, Ovid playing such a, ca a canny game. Kill power. It's been dropped. There are now six riders left. Kill Power of Belgium, Anders Voldegger of Denmark, Freddy Ovet of Australia, Jason Osborne and Mark Mading of Germany. And then Bjorn Andreasen, who's got 16 seconds of a lead as we head once more up the brute of a climb. That is the Clyde Kicker. There it is in front. Mercilessly rides up, rises up before them. Bjorn Andreasen is going to cross this one, get another power up. Who's going to take 
The next place over the line. Who's going to try it? It's Ovet who's distanced. Ovet is distanced. Is he going to leave it late? It looks like Ovet is going to always oh, going to go past Voldegger on the line. This is so, so close. One of the pre-race favourites is going to be eliminated. Ovet is out. Ovet is out of the race. That is a real shocker. We are now down to five. And one of the pre-race favourites, one of the most preeminent riders on the platform, is out of the race. Five left. One in the lead. Still got 11 seconds. He's got 11 seconds. Is there enough motivation? I mean, there's got to be all the motivation in the world. It's a world championship. But at this point, are they willing to risk anything on the front? Are they willing to even work together? Are they going to trust these sprints? There's so many questions going through their heads at this moment because, Matt, he may just be riding away in 11 seconds. We've got about five and three quarter minutes of effort left. Five, six minutes tops. Bjorn Andreasen at the moment has a gap of 11.44 seconds. And importantly, he's got a teammate behind. I wouldn't imagine Foldager will lead. But Jason Osborne and Mark Madding need to talk to each other. They need to bring this back right now for the world, for the rainbow bands. It is Germany versus Denmark. Two riders each, but it's a stalemate. Absolutely fascinating stuff. It really, really is. It is here now. We've got these. And then we've got on top of this, Gel Power able to sit in yep. and just watch these two, two countries, whether or not they're going to work together. But is Gel Power going to make a move or not here? As we see Mari now make his way to the front. This is what we need to see at this point. We're seeing a big move here from Mark Mati. Mati now with a massive kick. He's distanced himself and he says, I need to go now because this race is about to end and the world bands are on the line. Yep, the Andreessen still got a lead. Osborne, Madding has gone clear now. This is a big gap now for Madding. His second place on the road here. Absolutely powering across the gap. He's going very, very well. It's got the, with Jason Osborne there in second place. Just going to change the data on the right-hand side just to update that one for you. But this is what is unfolding on your screen. Osborne has been joined by a Voldager. Voldager is there now. So four riders left. Andreasen, this is Kel Power trying to get across the gap. Looks like no. Gel Power is going to be out of this one at this point, as it seems that he is not able to respond to those attacks here at this point. But Mark Modding, at 13 seconds, looking to be shut this down. This looks to be like an absolute race of attrition. Osborne and Anders Fodegar, are they going to make a chase? Is Osborne going to chase down his countrymen at this point and bring Anders Fodegar up is going to be a huge question, because Modding looks like he's got the effort to maybe bring this back. He's quickly closing this down. Gel Powers, though, he's going to be eliminated. Yep, Gel Power is out of the race now. So that is the last rider out. But meanwhile, we've gone right back to the front of the race. We have 2.6 kilometers to go before we will know who is going to be the UCI Cycling Esports World Champion for the Elite Men. And Andreasen at the moment has got a 12 second lead. It's hovered between 16 and 12 seconds. He's got his teammates, Foldager behind. Osborne and Mading are there. Well, this is absolutely astonishing stuff. It really, really is. Mading is now on his own. He's got six seconds over his teammate. I do think Andreasen, unless Mady can do something very special, it's going to take this. It really, yeah, this may be happening here at 12 seconds. That's a massive amount of time to bring back in one lap. This is the question of third place on the day right now. This is podium that's looking at you right in front of your eyes, whether or not they make it. Who makes it over in the, this place in between Osborne and Foldiger will decide a podium spot. Exactly. And that's why they're being tactical. I think Jason Osborne realizes that the championship, he won't be winning it again because the gap is too big. He hopes that his teammate just out of your view there just about to go round the corner on the right hand side meanwhile even further up the road by a good 100 meters or so is Bjorn Andreasen he took flight early on in the race in fact it was in the opening few meters he went clear a tactical master stroke but he's had to match it with raw power as well so smart aggressive riding looks as if he's going to be riding into the rainbow bands but this is almost a standoff now between Foldega and Osborne one more rider to be eliminated and then I think they're going to be spread across the road for the medals this is a finish line sprint for these two actually because it's for bronze at this point and then it's already gone up the road neck and neck at this point 13 watts per kilogram coming in here Anders Fodegar trying to take it down but it looks like Jason on board the former world champion is going to secure his spot for a bronze medal as Ad uh, Fodegar fades Folding a fades. Osborne's got to carry on. I don't think he's going to close the gap. I think Osborne's going to try and see what he can do. But meanwhile, up in front, Bjorn Andreasen is romping away to the championships. Andreasen is going to win this one. Meanwhile, we're focusing on Jason Osborne, a previous winner. But meanwhile, up in front, it is Denmark who are absolutely flying to the world championships. It's been a tactical masterstroke. It really has. It won't be too much longer. He's going to swing right. He'll be able to see the finish. He's got about one kilometer to go. But I don't think he's going to make it. 
Andreas in leads, Mailing in second, Jason Osborne has secured for third place, maybe second. Looks like Osborne is closing in on his teammate, but what a performance here by Andreasen. And he just rolled away with this from the right from the get-go. Don't sleep on Braun Anderson, that's for sure. And we kind of did in some of the predictions. He's kind of been underneath the radar. And when he went off the front, maybe that has something to do with it. The riders were like, Bjorn, he, is he going to be able to stay away with this? Most likely not. They're so used to the, to the roll through speed of Pax. And look at this now. Osborne, though, coming through. His modern put down too much to try and go across. And Osborne now rolls right through. Well, we're straight over the top. Clearly, Mading was fading there. Osborne straight through. He's got 450 meters to go. Mading back onto the wheel of his teammates. Are they going to try and ride together to close the gap? But 14 seconds is completely out of out of sight now. Bjorn Andreasen is going to take the title unless something catastrophic happens, unless he completely blows. But with a gap of 15 seconds, he is going to take it. He's into the last 250 meters. He's going to be riding to the gold medal. Bjorn Andreasen of Denmark is your brand new cycling esports world champion with a solo mission. Look at the delight on his face. He has been crowned the world champion here in Glasgow. What an absolutely supreme performance that was. Power, skill and a tactical supremacy. Meanwhile, Jason Osborne, the former champion, takes the silver medal just ahead of his teammate, Mark Mading. Fascinating stuff there, Nathan. That was, and letting them go that way. Anderson, right from the get-go, just rolling away. Look at the, look at this, the celebration afterwards, the hugs afterwards. He's already got a world <laughs> championship. He's shaking, he gets to wear those for a year. Absolutely loving this. Great ride from Bjorn Anderson and the Danish team. We said it from the get-go, watch out for the depth of this team, and they showed up in numbers. They certainly did. They had three riders in the final, Foldega, Vid, and Andreasen, but it's this man who drifted off the front very early on. He clearly had, well, from what we could see, Nathan, he clearly had a game plan and he stuck to it. The staccato style of racing behind, the way to go was to try and smooth that up and down circuit out into a time trial. And that is exactly what this man did. He is your brand new elite world champion. And isn't he delighted? Well, that's, uh, I tell you what, the women are going to look at these, the women now to come, we've got all to do again with the elite women. They're going to look at what happened here, I think, with great interest, aren't they? Definitely, and getting a number of riders in that final race, you know, we saw him go off the front, right? And there were two riders sitting in with the numbers that they had, there wasn't going to be as much chase. They were going to sit in and just go for those sprints and make sure that they were involved as much as they could. That probably had a little bit of an impact, and having some teamwork in the women's race is most likely what they're going to be thinking about, because the more you got in that final race the less matches you got to burn well absolutely breathless stuff we're going to do it all again now with the women but uh, your new esports world champion has been crowned for the men let's have a look at what they've got to say in the studio back to you hannah and dan Thank you very much, Matt. Wow, wow, wow. Congratulations to 21-year-old Bjorn Andreas, and not a name that really any of us had been thinking about as a potential world champion here at the UCI Cycling Esports World Championships, but he's done it, Hannah, and in quite spectacular fashion. Incredible. Committed straight from the beginning, having that, that lead, that advantage, which was yo-yoing all the way through, and it was looking likely that, well, he's got around three, four seconds. It's all going to come back together. He's, he's spent all these pennies, and he's not going to be able to hold them off. But he continued to do so, and the, the gap continued to grow as the race went on and went down to eight seconds, 12 seconds, 18 seconds, out towards 20 seconds. And the, the game plan that he came in with, it, that was obviously a pre-planned effort in, in order to go on and take that world title. As you said, Dan, 21 years of age, traditionally from a mountain bike cyclocross background, but now he's an eSports world champion. Yeah, and he's got those rainbow bands that I noticed that he had there ready for him. So maybe not as unexpected for him as it was for us, but let's take a look back at some of the highlights from the third and final round of the men's UCI eSports World Championships. Uh, three Danes, Hannah, in the final. Do you think that that was a big advantage for them when Andreasen did go off the front? I, I think it was a big advantage, um, it, but it, it, it was kind of, kind of so, uh, so happened that one of them went out relatively early. I like to see that they've got so much support, and this was a, another a big blow and a big surprise mm. that Freddie Ovet um, had gone out finishing in sixth place here. He just couldn't quite catch Andreas Foldager, the other Danish rider there. Yeah, I'll go through the whole results with the graphic for you shortly. It's very interesting seeing all these rider cameras, though, and the support crews 
and family and friends and fans that they've got alongside them to cheer them on. Absolutely brilliant stuff. But yes, the top ten, Zach Nair was the first to go out for the USA. Uh, then Oscar Hvid of Denmark, James Barnes of South Africa, Harvard Glednes of Norway, Freddie Ovet, as Hannah mentioned, in fifth place. He'll be disappointed with that sixth place, actually, I think. Kjell Powell was fifth, then Anders Fuldiger. And then we had the podium. Mark Mader in third place, Jason Osborne, as we saw just there on the screen, finishing runner-up, which means he's been on the podium on all three of the World Championships eSports cycling for the UCI. It's an incredible effort for him, despite not getting the win. But yeah, what can you say about Bjorn Andreasen? I mentioned the rainbow jersey there that they had to hand. They had a camera crew there. They had a boom mic. They had champagne. champagne. Yeah, Flowers. So they were well prepared to win, weren't they? They, they were incredibly confident that knowing that Andreasen the 21-year-old was was going to do something today and I think I wonder if he knew about it as well or whether they kept that completely out of his sight keep him focused just on the racing uh, but certainly a a very very nice moment here this was the moment that he got handed a, <laughs> a rainbow jersey and you can see the camera crew being sprayed in champagne wonderful scenes yeah brilliant Incredible. for Denmark Great to see as well support. I mean they were fantastic weren't they three of their riders reaching the final 10 and one of them taking the gold medal and the rainbow jersey and i believe that we are now able to cross over to denmark to speak to bjorn andreas and the brand new world champion first of all bjorn congratulations that was absolutely incredible i'm sure you're still recovering uh, it's a very obvious question to start off with but how do you feel uh i'm uh, i'm very tired i must say uh, I, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm dead and uh, I'm lost for words, actually. <laughs> How much was that uh, planned, your early attack in the third and final round there? I mean, obviously you needed to get to the final ten to begin with. In, had you thought about this before today or was this something that you thought, actually, I'm going to give it a go from the start of this final round? Uh, I'm uh, oh, the, the attack from the start box is like uh, my signature move. I've done it uh, a couple of times, and uh, I do it a lot. I can, uh, yeah, I can get the gap early, and uh, nobody really wants to follow in the start. And uh, yeah, I'm uh, riding mountain bike, uh, so it's it's not uh, very different from a mountain bike start. Yeah, quite a similar effort for you there, and it paid off. There was one point, though, I think about just before the halfway mark, where in sprinting for the places behind you, your gap came down to just over a second. And our commentator, Nathan, was saying that he thinks you should sit up now because you're about to be caught anyway. Was there any point in your head where you thought, I might be better off trying to save some energy and getting caught because the gap's so close? Or were you always going to press on? No, I knew uh, if I uh, got caught in the group, I would like do at least uh, the same amount of power in the sprints, and uh, and that would maybe be harder. And uh, the more sprints I could like uh, skip from the front, the better. Uh, then I would still have the 30-second power or more than the other guys had. Um, yeah. So, so I just uh, I, I kept going as long as I could, and uh, yeah, with after the last sprint, I uh, I could see the gap was so big. Uh, yeah, I I could hold it to the finish line, <laughs> and uh, yeah. Yeah, but, I bet uh, you couldn't. I bet you couldn't just, believe it. Just crazy. <laughs> no, no. Uh, how were the legs feeling on the third and final round? Because there were very short rest breaks between rounds one to two and two to three. I mean, it looked from your power to watts per kilo, should I say. It was always around six watts per kilo. Your legs looked good from the numbers, but how did they feel? Uh, actually, the legs felt better and better and better and better. <laughs> uh, yeah. I must say, yeah. Was uh, there any team tactics I, uh, beyond? Between yeah, your yeah, yeah, the two boss, Danish teammates. In the in the first race, I should uh, just go with with uh, everyone that that was going uh, to the front. Uh, yeah, and I was in in every attack that was. I was uh, with them, and in the second one, I knew I, ju I should just get in the top ten and try to save as much energy I I could, and then. Uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. In the in the third round, I just said I'm I'm going from the start. And just before yeah, we let you I go, did. Bjorn, um, your thoughts on this format of having three rounds, three very different rounds tonight. It's very different to what we've seen for the first two UCI Esports World Championships. Is it something you think they should continue? Yeah, I uh, I think it's very good. I like uh, round uh, two and three actually. I think the first round is a bit too short. It's uh, yeah, a lot of guys is uh, going off the yeah, going out of the world championships after only 14 kilometers, and I would say that's that's a little a little too yeah. It it should be 30 kilometers the first race. That would be. Uh, that would be better. Well, I'm sure Zwift are listening and will take on your feedback. But once again, huge congratulations. Uh, enjoy the celebration, enjoy the champagne, and most of all, enjoy wearing the rainbow bands as world champion. Congratulations again, Bjorn. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, I don't think he can really right. believe it just yet, Hannah, and you can sort of see why, really. Like I said, not one of the pre-race favourites. He might well have been thinking that he had a good chance, but to carry it off like that, I mean, there's nothing like winning in a solo fashion, is Absolutely there? Absolutely not. And you, when you see that middle part of the, the final race in race three, almost touch and go as to whether he would maintain his lead, maintain his advantage, or whether it would all come back together. And I guess all it would have taken from the chasing group behind is that one last little surge, and that breakaway would have all been over. And I think you saw his commitment there when it, the gap did come down to that one, two seconds of an advantage. And he, he maintained and he believed in himself that he could still stay mm. away. And I, th I do think his, his background in mountain biking, cyclocross, having come um, back from a, a two-week training camp in Calpe certainly paid off and, and really played into his advantage of a, a fast start mm. from, from the get-go. Yeah, and it's very interesting. Obviously, the riders behind, they don't want to chase and yeah. use their energy to bring everyone else back, do they? Uh, right, well, we said earlier we'd hear more from Manon up in Glasgow, and that's exactly what we're going to get now. I believe that she has got Mick Rogers of the UCI to chat to. So let's hand you back over to Manon Lloyd up in Glasgow right now. I'm now joined by Chris Hoy and Mick Rogers, Head of Road and Innovation at the UCI. But firstly, Chris, this is the first of many World Championships that are coming to Glasgow and Scotland. What does it mean for the area? Oh, it's going to be massive um, for Glasgow and for Scotland. I think it's great to see Glasgow getting behind these major sporting events like the Commonwealth Games in 2014, European Championships in 2018, and now the, the biggest cycling event in history is going to be taking place right here. It's, it's so exciting. And I mean, this crowd here has put on quite a good show and hopefully we're going to see more of that in the World Championships coming up. But the World Championships here today are kind of like an endurance take. Would you like to see some more like sprint specific events in the future? For the eSports, you mean? Yeah, definitely. I think it's, it's a, a huge opportunity there for uh, some shorter sprinting, bring slightly different athletes in, different events, a bit like the track. You know, you can get a wide array of different athletes taking part. But I think even tonight, seeing the different format with the elimination race there, the three different races, it, it showed the different styles of racing you can have on Zwift. Would you make a comeback if it was uh, going to happen? <laughs> if it was less than 200 metres, I might consider it. But uh, yeah, I think that's a no. <laughs> I'm going to make it happen, though. <laughs> but Mick, how has the UCI and Zwift made it a really level playing field for all the athletes? Because it's quite hard to control. Well, it is. Um different people coming across from all around the world, all participating in the same event. We've worked very hard with, with Swift and also the partner, uh, home trainer partner Wahoo, have done a fantastic job of putting all riders on the same hardware and a, a level playing field. And where do you see the future for eSports going in cycling? Well, I think it will continue to uh, develop. I, I think uh, this has been a, a, a successful test for us here at the World Championships, uh, bringing people together in one room and also, again, makes fairer competition uh, by having everyone here on the same equipment, being weighed in here, and um, we're so excited. Yes. Yeah, well, it definitely has been a great experience tonight, and we've got the women just warming up, and their event will be shortly, but we'll throw back to you in the studio. Thank you once again, Manon. Great to hear from some cycling royalty up there in Glasgow. We now have just under three minutes until the start of the women's race, and so, 
We are going to have a look at some of the key favourites for that race. Lois Adekist is a former world champion in this discipline. Uh, so, as expected, one of the favourites on our graphic there. Uh, we've also got Mary Wilkinson, Zoe Langham from Team GB, Kristen Kolchinski, who'd be a very popular winner, and Mira Söderström uh, riding for Sweden. Uh, actually, it's not even uh, three minutes now until the start, so it's now time for me to hand you back to the commentators. Nathan back here with me in the studio. Hannah's run up to be alongside Matt Stevens, so I'm going to hand you back over to them now. More excitement to come over three rounds, the exact same three for the women. Over to you, Matt. Thank you very much, Dan. I've had a cup of tea, I've had a gel, and I'm powered up for the second batch of races here. It is the Women's Elite Race number one. It is back on the punch circuit. We've seen what happened before in the men. We've now got another set of rainbow bands up for grabs, and there's number one. That is Lois Adderhaste of the Netherlands, part of a six-rider team. Another big team at the Swedes. They have eight riders. Great Britain have the biggest team here. And all of them, of course, are up in Glasgow alongside uh, Sir Chris Hoy there. 12 riders strong as we roll through the rest. That is really a, a deep team. But, of course, nothing is guaranteed, especially in this first round. 14.2 kilometres on this circuit. And only the first 30 riders will actually go through. We've got 87 riders starting out as we continue to scroll through. Hanna Ludwig there of Germany, a very decent a German team. Seven riders deep. Three riders from Belgium there, as you can see. Uh, good Canadian contingent, Rossignol, Lawson, Rathwold, Keller and Paquet. Three from Norway as well, three from France. And then we have a group of riders from various nations fielding one solitary rider. Ireland have a good team there with uh, Heather Foley, Imogen Cotter, Linda Kelly and Natalie Franco. A former Swift Academy finalist there for Colombia as we see the riders rolling through. Breathless stuff we saw from the men. I'm expecting the same for the women. I think the, the format, um, a lot to be discussed. I'm really in, enjoying it, Hannah. Great to have you alongside me. Um, this should be fun, shouldn't it? I mean, uh, again, it could be, they could ride this completely differently to the men. Who knows? I mean, because we just haven't raced this format very often. I'll be really intrigued to see how many of the women racing now were keeping a close eye on what happened in the men's race and how things unfolded whilst also making sure that they're prepared for anything that can happen, that they're reactive to, to the race that they are in and, and the moves that start to go and, and potentially start to go. And straight away, this is a, a very, very fast start in the opening uh, kilometre. It is. Well, the opening kilometre or so is pretty flat. Let me just drop off. We lose quite a little bit of elevation heading towards the breakaway bray for the first time. And then we loop back round and we finish on the very same climb. And first time through the breakaway Bray will get the only power-up as we continue to focus on the world champion. She knows what it's like to wear those rainbow bands. Great to see so many uh, power-ups being dropped. And a quick reminder again, if you are watching and you've got your phone handy with the Zwift Companion app, please do give these riders a ride on. It is all about the community. Of course, there are riders here who have been handpicked by their nations, but many of the riders too across both the men's and the women's discipline have come through from the community at a grassroots level. And it really is uh, representative of, uh, of cycling and of course racing on the digital platform. There's one of the big pre-race favorites and one of the most popular riders on Zwift in eSports, Kristin Kulczynski. Kristin Kulczynski is one of the best Zwift riders that we have seen racing. She's a level 60 Zwifter. She's done over 100,000 kilometers on this platform. <laughs> it's quite remarkable. And Kristen Kulczynski, I know she's worked incredibly hard towards this World Championships, and she wants those rainbow bands. She is so dedicated uh, to, to try and take home those rainbow bands to the USA. She's a much loved rider but also a rider who i think across this format is really going to have to use her effort very wisely she really totally. thrives on a type of course with those difficult climbs where it's attritional and it really um puts the, the the suffering to others that's where she really starts to thrive so i think for this first round once if she can can make it through and really use uh, her performance to her advantage on the on the climb on breakaway Bray that I think it'll take confidence into to the next two races. Yeah, I think it's fair to say, even by her own admittance, she's not the most explosive of riders. She hasn't got that sprint. And there'll be a lot of riders thinking the same thing. How do I look at this course over its 14.2 um, kilometers, relatively short? 
It's just going to be around 19 or 20 minutes. They're not, but they're only about 10 minute turnaround until we uh, hit the climb. And then, of course, the final race of the podium. So 100 up. We've got our 87 riders starting, 30 through, and then 10 through to the final round. As we look at Mary Wilkinson, another very, very popular rider on Zwift and a former Zwift Academy finalist as well. Um, in the GB kit there, she knows how to ride on Zwift. And she likes a nutritional race very much like Kristin Kulczynski. But what we've seen Mary Wilkinson improve on over the last couple of years is that real sharp punch. She still needs to go relatively long, but she's still pretty explosive. But by going long, it means that she can get a gap and she's able to maintain that high power for a longer period of time over those who are perhaps more suited as a, a pure sprinter. So Mary Wilkinson, she does have that explosive kick that she's able to maintain. And interesting that she's uh, racing from home by the looks of it. She hasn't traveled up to, to Glasgow, as has Charlotte Colclough deciding to to race from home. She's been suffering with a little bit of illness over the last couple of weeks. So she's coming into this with no real expectation. Likewise, with a, uh, a couple of other riders so far and who are racing today. And unfortunately, Brie Vine not taken to the start for Australia. So that's a big blow to the Australian team. Likewise, with Katie Banerjee, who suffered a, a very bad crash a couple of weeks ago. So again, comes into this with no, uh, no real expectation or high expectations. Yeah, Tanya Erath there. Another former Swift Academy winner, in fact, has stepped away from the professional game um, after several seasons, riding at the high highest level. And she is a qualified nurse doctor over in Germany. And, and again, one of the most likable characters on the scene. Um, and it's still a potent force. Very good track rider as well. And she knows how to ride on Swift, just drifting towards the back there. That is one of the best places to sit in terms of getting the draft right, right towards the back, sitting in the wheels, just surfing, saving energy. And we heard a couple of interviews earlier on from some of the men. Um, it's this, such an explosive set of efforts on the assumption you get through to the final. It's going to take a lot out of you. So as much as you can, without risking it all, you've got to play a very canny game. So you know you've got to dig in, but you've just got to hold back a little bit. And um, some riders who possess that real punch, that real sprint, can afford to sit back. But riders who can't have still got to concern energy but somehow find a way of getting through to the next round there's so many different permutations to think about there certainly is Matt and it's that fine balance isn't it between the the confidence knowing where you need to be where you can save energy but at the same time making sure that you're able to move up through the pack maintain position make sure that you're you're never too far away from the the dropout zone um, of course only 30 riders going through in race one so making sure that you, uh, you finesse your way around the peloton. No, definitely. And we're heading up to Breakaway Brave for the very first time. This will be where the power-up is given. Everybody gets the same one. It is the burrito power-up. And uh, Charlotte Colclough has gone clear on the front. Good little move. Now, Femke van der Zee, sorry, should I say, has gone clear. Opens up a small lead. Just making sure she's at the head of affairs and also just making sure she gets a sense of how to climb how to climb this hill because it is a difficult one. It's only short, 600 metres at 4%, flattens towards the line with that steep kick at the bottom, maxing out at 14%. So in, in terms of of a profile of a climb, it's it's short but sweet, but if you if you get the timing wrong, you're out of the World Championships. So you need to get this climb right, don't you? you? We've seen that in the men's race, didn't we, where riders had gone too early and unfortunately didn't progress through the rounds because they had just made their move just that little bit too early. However, you've got to be able to willing to take a risk to to make it through as well and play to your strengths as a, a rider. And if you don't have those capabilities uh, capabilities with that, that big explosive acceleration um, and, uh, and a high one minute power, because that's where the, the riders who who do have a, a, a very strong one minute power, the likes of Mjallin uh, uh, Bjarhead, the Swedish rider, likewise with Jacqueline Godby, the rider from the USA, they're able to almost rely on on their ability as a rider and their performance. Exactly, and that really, in, in, in eSports, that's the holy grail. If you ask any of these riders what, if anybody from the community is looking at this and we look at Lam Kong, great shot there of the Hong Kong rider. I believe that is her dog. Well, clearly it's her dog. I would have, wouldn't have thought it's a random dog just uh, ending up in her living room, but uh, <laughs> first bit of pet action we've seen. I did think we see- Great supporter. Like, yeah, great supporter. I mean, clearly oblivious to what's going on. Great to see Lam Kong there, uh, sat in the bunch there, 
the only representative from Hong Kong. I, again, another illustration of, um, of, of the, the democratic nature of cycling, not just in the, in the rule, but here in the virtual world of Zwift, up in Glasgow in Scotland. I do love the World Championships, seeing the, the iconic rainbow bands, but more importantly, the colour in the peloton here, uh, the, the different nations coming together to celebrate cycling in this new format. I think it's just wonderful. There's something special about the world, isn't there? There, there is, and like you say, you, you take a look at all these jerseys, all the different colours. You, you can see uh, a few riders from Sweden there. We've got Colombia, South Africa, Ireland, also Finland, Austria, Argentina. There's just so many different nations represented, and you see the strength in depth of, of the nations as well, and how many riders have been able to qualify for this World Championships. It's brilliant to see, and I think it's almost very wide open. Um, I, I think the beauty of this is there's some riders here who haven't raced against each other in some of the the weekly racing leagues that we've seen. They've only raced within their, their continent, so they That's haven't come up against each point. other to almost see themselves side by side. What is their strength in comparison to another rider, let's say one from European continent to yeah. someone uh, over in, in the American continent. That's a really, really good point. Yeah, traditionally they've raced a lot together. But this season in particular, it's been a different look season 2022 into 2023. So as you say, the continent separated a little bit as we look at Hannah Ludwig, a very good rider on the track, good time trialist as well, uh, representing uh, Germany, focus there, just giving us an indication of the effort level, just under four watts a kilo. There's a heart rate there. So watts, heart rate and the RPM, revolutions per minute, Quite a tactical day, games being played here. 6.7 k's to go. And interestingly, we haven't seen one. Well, we just saw one rider just float off the front from the Netherlands just on the climb. But we're just heading back round, looking at some of this beautiful scenery here. It really does look absolutely cracking as we're looking at uh, some riders in the drop zone. So we look at the peloton. It's about um, 0.27 of a second, isn't it? So nobody is off the back just yet that we're aware of as we look at Hannah Ludwig in, in the centre as we continue to wend our way um, on this rolling terrain. Great to see some more power-ups being dropped as we look at the stats of another one of our American riders, Morgan Usney. 6.3 k's to go. Riders are going to be getting nervous, how? And, and how much do you think that um, traditionally in the World Championships it is a real team game? If you look at the, uh, the road um, in, in particular, there's a real, maybe one rider's protected, maybe two normally just one here is going to be very different especially given this new format it's almost okay we've got as many people as we can let's get as many people as we can in the front and see what happens tactics it's going to be interesting, uh, isn't it? It's <laughs> going to be very interesting. And I wonder if some of the, the federations who have got um, a lot of riders who have qualified for this, the likes of Great Britain, for example, who have got 12 riders yep. who qualified for this World Championships. Like you say, Matt, in this first race, it's everybody for themselves. Make sure that you're in that, that top 30, and then we'll start to look at tactics into race two. And then should riders make it through into race three, then we'll look at tactics again. But the, the, the key thing is to make it into race two is that we've got strength in numbers again. And so it's very, very interesting, isn't it, to, to see how strong some of these nations are. The, the likes of Spain, for example, or Japan, Portugal, they've only got the sole rider represented. So. It's all about looking after yourself. You've still got your, your team director in your, in your ear giving you some information. He's, they'll be in the virtual team car, so they can give that information, what's happening out on the road that you can't quite see, giving you that encouragement. And especially those who are in arenas, we've seen lots of fed, uh, federations and nations Indeed. in the organized arenas where you've got the support from the crowd, the fans, friends, family members. How much more does that give you as well? Exactly. Well, just look at that spectacular scenery there. These are the cliffs. We're heading around the far part of the circuit. Soon be coming up to five kilometers ago. This is race number one of the Elite Women's Cycling Esports World Championships. We're in virtual Glasgow in Scotland, and we will be back in Glasgow in Scotland in August. Um, for the first collective World Championships. Every four years now, we're going to have a World Championships, which is a celebration of all of our beautiful disciplines within this sport, apart from cyclocross. Um, and there will be an eSports contingent there as well. So you can come out and try Zwift if you head up to Glasgow in August. But meanwhile, with 4.7 k's to go, it is all back together, all, to all completely together, should I say. I don't think from what I can see, there are any riders who've been detached, and it really is a tactical effect, it looks like, this is going to be one big bunch of kick. It just, I just get the sense of that, that people are just going to leave it till very, very late indeed. 
I think they will do. Like you say, Matt, there's nobody who has started to be distanced at the moment. Everybody is still within the the striking distance of making it through to round two. So very, very interesting. And interesting to see that drop zone there. Ana Delana, the Spanish rider, has been so consistent at, at keeping herself right at the back, but it's almost right on the cusp of those who will who will drop out. Exactly. And this is where the experience of racing on Zwift racing esports really comes into play is understanding how to sit in the wheels understanding how the peloton moves the science within drafting understanding when to accelerate understanding when to rest a little bit understanding when to pile to put the power down off the back of a descent um, this course has been raced before over the last few weeks it's been open to federations to hold events on there's been some other open events on here so many of these riders well all of these riders you would imagine have trained on this course and done small events on this one if you've got any hope of winning the world championships you need to sample scotland don't you because it is very different but as we move on to the next round to the climb and then onto the podium they haven't been raced on so uh, this is the only one that will feel familiar i think the interesting thing coming into this world championships was which nations had done and, and organized their own private training sessions so great britain were, were very active in making sure that they provided their riders with a lot of opportunities to train on it and then really take a look at the course likewise with denmark sweden norway so they have really put a lot of focus uh, um, coming into this this world championships and it's worth noting matt that you can see various different types of, of bikes and equipment used by the riders. Everything is completely neutralized here. Yeah. And so nobody has an advantage of a, a different bike, different wheels, different helmet. Everything is on a, uh, a level playing field, likewise with the Wahoo Kicker V6. Yeah, I mean, uh, a lot of you eagle-eyed uh, Zwifters out there will notice some of the riders on, on the colloquially titled Tron bike, um, but which is slightly more aerodynamic than others in, ra in certain race situations at certain speeds. But as you correctly said, all the bikes are standardized. So regardless of the equipment that you see, the rim depth, the helmet choices, because there's some quite fun helmets that people wear. We saw a cloth cap back in the men's race. <laughs> uh, but no, beautiful. Look at all the heather out to the left-hand side here. Of course, these riders just focused on the job at hand, but it really is a wonderful world. 2.8 kilometers to go. The tension is really starting to build. Will a couple of riders, will one rider try and go for it? Will it be a rider that doesn't quite trust their ability in the sprint? We've got the little climb of the corkscrew just up ahead there. You can see that cluster of buildings. This is the climb before the climb. It's a really nasty little kicker. Kicks up to eight or nine percent. Then we drop down a wonderful way somebody we will see somebody try their luck on this climb before the final the final climb to the line I think if any rider isn't confident in their explosive power that 30 second 50 second Effort that they're they're needing to make to the finish This will be one of the times that they need to try and make a move and you can start to see Haley Simmons there Starting to ramp things up at the moment the rider from Great Britain. She's competed in the world championships before on esports and on on many occasions on the road for Great Britain starts to go back through the pack now as Lizzie Brook, the Iron uh, Ironman former triathlete as well, starts to move her way up as does Fios to be of Denmark. Yep, this is where a few of the riders are going to want to try and make it hard. Riders that won't possess that real sharp acceleration and want to go long will try and at least make it harder for the real sprinters in this group on that little bit of a climb, just to try and deaden the legs a little bit. It is indeed Jackie Godby. She's had some big, big victories over the years. She drops back. Lou Bates, a very, very fast finish for Great Britain in or around the top five there, moving through to the front. The experienced Hannah Ludwig of Germany constantly rotating that r real washing machine effect. This is where the road just drops down ever so slightly 1500 meters to go positioning crucial making sure you don't get caught at the back and distance because once you lose the slipstream of the bunch of the riders in front of you it is so so difficult in game to get back in contact but it is all together 1300 meters to go hannah Miller bruni up towards the front as is justine barrow the rider from australia Femke Dizzy also up there for the Netherlands. And you can see how much this top 10 is ever changing as riders want to try and make sure that they've positioned themselves well going as into the lower slopes of this climb. And you can see already it's almost a little bit of a false flat here. You can see the gradient changing from, from 1% to, to, to uh, zero again. And they'll round here, take this right corner, and you can see... Lots of riders dropping and deploying their burrito power up now, Matt. Here we go. We've got 600 metres to go now. Remember, the first 
30 riders to go through to the next round, which is the climb. We started out with 87 starters. There's a few just starting to get tailed up as the tailed off as the pace starts to ramp up. The climb kicks. This is where the climb is at its steepest. It is Lou Bates. A lot of riders from Great Britain at the front. Christine Kolchinski, one of the pre-race favorites. She's need, she needs to go along. She needs to stay inside the top 30. Everybody, if they want to qualify, needs to stay there. We're coming towards the top. It's for Haran, Langham, out of haste. Tanya Erath, Kolchinski is there as well. Which is, it just flattens out towards the top. Well, a lot of the favorites are there. Looks like it's going to be Jackie Godby. She drops a burrito. She crosses the line. She is safely home. Langham, Führer, Keller, Erath, Kolchinski all through. Uh, Lucy Harris too. Well, they are your qualifiers. There is the... the the final rider through, Vicky Whitelaw, just by the skin of her teeth. Joanna Tidham, Lucy Harris, and Nelly Larson also there. So a lot of the pre-race favourites are in the mix. But that was a very, very tactical round. Incredibly tactical round there. This uh, is a Lizzie, Lizzie Brook. Brooke, who is in our uh, picture. There's Natalie Stevenson on the right-hand side. Just uh, looks very happy looking through the results as to whether she has qualified. She's the local rider. She is from Glasgow. So very, very special for her to be racing in a home world championships. She spent a lot of time um, and, and many months once she qualified for this world championships, focusing on this world championships, really dedicating herself to try and win. I'm just making sure Lewis Adahase did qualify. The, the, the defending champion, Lewis Adahase is there. Tanya Erath will uh, pick through all of the 30 riders that has qualified. But for now, it's back to Dan and Nathan in the studio. Thanks again to Matt. Round one of the Women's UCI Esports World Championships final uh, done and dusted. Two more rounds to go, and that means that we've got 30 riders left with a chance of becoming the next world champion in this discipline. I'm back in the studio now with Nathan Guerra. Takeaways from round one in the women's race for you? Well, that was uh, very calm, actually, up front. We didn't see, in the men's race, we saw a lot of attempts to get away, and then we had actually a group form and tried to make those moves. We said maybe most likely wouldn't happen. We saw it then not succeed. Now in the women's race, completely different story, actually. Everybody saved their cards, holding all their aces until that final kick, really, and it really, at the, end of the, at the end of that race, 30 seconds is what they had. And we're going to have a look at the finish again now of the uh, women's race here. We said right at the very beginning of the programme, Nathan, that really you don't want to be winning round one. You want to save as much as you possibly can do while still going through to round two. There was a bit of a flex from Godby there at the end, but then in the first round of the men's race, Maida was the winner, in inverted commas, and he went on to finish on the podium at the end. So what are your thoughts on the people that have finished top three in round one here? Really interesting to see that Godby would give so much once she knew she had it secured there. Definitely, I would call it a flex. I mean, look at the distance that she is gaining on the rest of the athletes. She's pulling a full two watts per kilogram over the top. And that essentially, is that just a mark of dominance is a question I have there. Uh, as she's the number one rider there through and looks to be saying, I'm here for the USA. Mm. Yeah, like you said, it wasn't just winning the sprint. She had over a second distance between her and everybody else in the race. Uh, Zoe Langham also up there in third place for Team GB. She was one of the pre-race favourites. We saw Kolchinski go reasonably early in the final there. She finished just outside the top ten. Happy with that, you presume? Yeah, definitely happy. I was a little worried, actually, with how early some of the favourites were going and whether or not they were going to end up being a lead-out train and perhaps getting a little bit nervous. You know, oh, I make sure I'm in the right position and end up just dragging some uh, athletes in line. But the burrito, the reality of the burrito power-up, I think, probably made them think no one's going to be drafted on me. This is just going to be woman versus woman to the line, so I can go a little bit mm. early as I see burritos dropped around me. Yeah, well, let's have a look at the results now and the all-important top 30 who have gone through to round two, which is, of course, the climb. Uh, Godby there, well, like I said, with a one-second advantage over everybody else. Söderström of Sweden was another rider we mentioned and had in our graphic as a pre-race favourite. Uh, Lush Adakes, the former world champion, there in sixth place for the Netherlands, now, of course, rides for FDJ Suez on the road. Very successful she has been, too. Uh, Liz Van Hurling there in tenth place, Kulczynski in eleventh, and then if we go a little bit further down, uh, Team GB with a number of rides there, including Mary Wilkinson, who finished 18th. Vicky Whitelaw, very lucky there in 30th place. Well, maybe not lucky, maybe she just played it perfectly, Nathan. 
Yeah, well, Vicky Whitelaw is definitely one to watch out for for something similar to what we saw from Bjorn Anderson, actually, because she's a great time trialist if she can try and find her way to get away. And this would be the race that she most likely was worried about making it through. So she just barely did that. Mm. And Lizzie Brooke, I think, was one of the riders who said as a pre-race favourite and started her sprint very early. She snuck in there in 26th place in the end. Uh, right, so well, one of the riders that we spoke to ahead of this World Championships was Kristen Kolchinski. She focuses almost all of her cycling efforts on Zwift, very rarely races outside or even rides outside. Uh, she was quite nervous, I can tell you, just a week before the start of this race. But let's hear what her thoughts were ahead of it. What would it mean to you to win the Rainbow Bands? Oh, my God. Um... I just got like little chills. Um, I mean, it would just, it would mean the world to me just to come from like, uh, like basically going from the beginning of these elite and pro races that started on Zwift back in the start of the pandemic to, to now and just see the, the growth and the opportunity that, that I've had being able to race in real life professional women, which is just mind boggling. So to, to have, that, uh, I mean, it would just, it would be everything. Like, it would just be amazing. Um, <laughs> I, I would have to, I would have to stand up there and give my Oscar speech of all the, all the people that helped me get there <laughs> because it, it wasn't just me. It was my coach. It was my, it was meeting Nicola Cranmer from 2024. It, there were so many people, my family support. And when you look at the three races, for you specifically and, and your physiological strengths, does it suit you, would you say? I think so. I've been working on um, my weaknesses the past year, just trying to get my sprint better, trying to get my timing better, trying to get my, um, you know, drafting and then like knowing where to conserve and then just go for it. So I've been really working on my power. I mean, I my comfortable place is more in that like, you know, steady efforts of like 20 plus minutes where like that's where I'm happiest, but um, you got to work on things that aren't your strengths. So that's what I've been working on. Kristen Kolchinski there. I looked her up on the Zwift Companion app just before we went on air today. Uh, she's ridden over 100,000 kilometres on Zwift and tackled almost half a million metres of elevation gain in that time. You could say she's quite experienced on this platform. Yeah, she definitely is. You know, she really took to this during uh, lockdown and from there on out, you know, made her way on the uh, 2024 team. And she's been a leader on that team, actually, for quite a while. P finding talent in the community and then other talent coming from in real life road racing, actually, from that team underneath her wing to kind of train them up as to how they can race. And that's been happening, actually, a ton in a lot of our community races with Community uh, Racing League, as well as in the Zwift Grand Prix. Yeah, and it's interesting to hear how she's had to change her training slightly on the lead into this World Championships because she's known as someone that loves the longer climbs and going on the attack early. But although we've got the climb coming up, it's short and punchy, multiple climbs, isn't it? So you can understand why she's looked to get a bit more punchy herself, really, more explosive. Yeah, it's interesting. When she's racing against some of the other teams, what they say when Kolchinski goes off the front, especially in like a points race, let her go do her thing. <laughs> we're not going to chase that down. Mm. Kolchinski's gone. Now we're going to go clean up some points maybe and instead of try and chase down her where she's just on another level but yeah she's definitely been working on her sprint power because when it comes to this and the punch to the line that's definitely where I would have been a little bit worried mm. and I was a little worried if she'd make it through this first round she's proven herself though. Yeah I think she was worried as well I'm sure she'd be very relieved that she's safely finished inside the top 30 in 11th place in round one. Right, another one of the rides that we interviewed in the week leading up to this race, who thankfully has also progressed through to round two, is Team GB's Zoe Langham, who is training whilst working 60 hours a week as a doctor. This is what she had to say. So we've got a brand new format for this Saturday evening. So you've done the World Championships before, you're very experienced on Zwift, but how different is it going to be with these three short rounds? really different they're really hard if anyone's done them um i know they're, they're some of the hardest races i think i've ever done i've never vomited off the side of my turbo before until these races um so yeah really tough but i get i, I think it's exciting for us it's exciting for viewers and it kind of cuts out that in between part where we were rolling around just in the peloton um, and not not loads was happening it kind of shortens it down to just the the really nitty gritty this is where the action happens parts of the race um i think it's really clever uh i think it's going to be really stressful and tough 
but uh, yeah, exciting. I know you've been working extremely hard and trying to fit your training in and around a, a very hectic lifestyle with work. So where do you feel like you're at? I work um, kind of, I get up and, at six, half six in the morning and I'm, I'm in work for eight and then I don't get back till six, half seven in the evening. Um, and I have to get straight on the turbo if I'm going to do any sort of training at all. Uh, so that has been really, really tricky. And I think with recovery as well, I'm definitely not getting anything like the recovery that ideally somebody should be if they're, if they're training for an event like this. But I'm, I am stronger than I was before uh, last year. Um, but women cycling in general is just getting stronger. So I'm, I'm happy with whatever position I come this year, to be honest, because I know myself that I've progressed. And I think that's all, all you can ask is the best out of yourself, isn't it? Zoe Langham there, who had also said that she vomited in a similar sort of discipline on Zwift just a few weeks ago. It's a bucket at the ready for her, I'm sure, between the rounds. Uh, she said she'd be happy with kind of wherever she comes in this final. Do you believe that? Because she is one of the big favourites, Nathan. Yeah, I mean, watching her in the European Zwift Racing League, Zoe Langham shows up and we're talking about Zoe Langham pretty much the whole time. She can do it all when it comes to Zwift. Big favourite coming from the Wahoo Lacole team and racing now for Great Britain. Always be on the watch out. She's kind of a leader on her trade team, actually, in that whole respect. So she can take any points and usually a finish line sprint. Mm. I'd be watching out for Zoe. And it's going to be really interesting to see the Americas racing the Europeans that we don't get to see that often. And now they're coming together here in this World Championship. I'm really interested to see Kate, Kristen Kolchinski, Zoe yeah. Langham head to head. Yeah, they really won't know what to expect, will they? I mean, you sent me a rundown of the favorites for the men's and women's races a, a few days before this event. Next to Zoe's name, you basically said she doesn't have a weakness. And that's really important in these three rounds, which are quite different from one to the next, isn't it? Yeah, and the qualifiers, the main reason I said that was in the content of the qualifiers, we saw her take down lots of sprints, but be right there in the climb in Innsbruck, actually, on the Innsbruck World Championship course that Zwift had made. She took on that 20-ish minute climb like a regular climber, although she's out there taking every sprint that she wants. So yeah, that's why I said she really is just one of the best all-arounders. Mm, and all the more impressive than what she's doing, uh, given that she's fitting it in around a full-time job and working incredible hours as well. Uh, now, for those of you who weren't with us for the men's races a little bit earlier on, this is what the riders are going to be facing in round two tonight, and it's called the climb. And not just one, but three ascents of the Skur climb. They are going to pick up the anvil power-up near the start of the race, and that's going to make the riders 50 kilograms heavier for 30 seconds, so we'll see it being deployed on the descent. In the men's, they seem to use it on the second descent, but we'll see whether the women choose the same tactics. Uh, we'll have to wait and see on that one. Uh, after the second of those descents, it's time for the final climb to the finish line, and only the first 10 riders, to remind you, across that finish line are going to progress into the third and final race. The pressure's on, Nathan. How do you think this is going to play out compared to the men's? I mean, we saw the Argentina Massinio go on the attack inside the closing kilometres there. Do you see anything happening a bit earlier in the women's race or do you think it will be a bit cagey again? It's really hard to tell. You know, what was really interesting was the use of the anvils and how they actually impacted the race for me. We saw a few favourites off the back because of that. I saw a Belgian jersey. I believe it was Lionel Viasen, one of the favourites, and he ended up, ended up not getting through because of that. We also saw Tapalorio off the back because of the anvil use. And that dirt section that we saw on the climb uh, coming down and then back up for the finish... That's going to be a really interesting section where some gaps could open up. And uh, Messonio, he actually launched his attack through, I think, knowing he would get a separation without a draft on him. Then we saw, though, the roll-through speed with Osborne ramping things up. It was just too much to hold on, and Messonio ended up off the back. So it's going to be extremely tactical. It's almost really hard to tell. How does that dirt section affect things? Is it just more rolling resistance and therefore easier to create a gap or harder to stay on the wheel? Exactly. The more rolling resistance when somebody jumps then really hard, you've got to go that much harder to hang on. In our team time trials and things like that on Zwift, a lot of people know, hey, the dirt's coming, be careful, it's easier to get dropped here. So that definitely is a section people can watch out for to try and form gaps quickly and then sustain them all the way to the finish. Of the 30 riders then very quickly that we've got left, who do you expect to go early? Uh, well, we just saw Jackie Godby, maybe, because here's the thing, she could fade climb then a little bit. She isn't known quite as well for the climbing. She's definitely got that punch. We just saw it. Yeah. So maybe Jackie Godby is going to try and be a race more of attrition. Okay, well, we will see. Right then, 
For the fifth time tonight, I'm going to hand you over to our commentary team. It's Hannah Walker, and first up, you're going to hear the voice once again of Matt Stevens. Thank you very much, Dan. This is it. This is race number two. The climb, as Dan said, is his three ascents of the Segur Summit. Two from the north, one from the south. We've only got 30 riders left. And there's some very, well, most of the main protagonists you would have imagined to have got through have got through one or two surprises, but the world champion is through, as we know, an amazing performance from Sweden with seven riders through to the next round. So they are the dominant team, five from Great Britain, four from the United States of America, three from Germany. Early on in this race, just in the first 500 meters, as we pass through Central Station in Glasgow, they'll get the Anvil power up and then they'll go up the north Segur climb, drop back down, head up the south to commence the finishing climb. It's only a short course, this one, 8.6 kilometers, 161 meters of elevation. This is the city and the Segur. Hannah, an interesting race we saw early on, very, very tactical, but looking at the composition of the 30 riders that have come through to this next round, there's so much quality there, isn't there? There is, and that was not an easy finish up to uh, up the climb in race one. And when you see, like you just mentioned, Matt, seven riders from Sweden qualified, five from Great Britain, five from the from USA, and there's a lot of strength and depth within all those 30 that have, have qualified and lots of names that we're, we're very familiar with in Zwift racing. So it's going to be another difficult finish here. And with it being so short and with so much elevation gain, it's, uh, it's going to be another good race. Yep, it's only going to be about four, I don't know, 13, between 13 and 15 minutes. My, my rough estimate of effort is Jackie Godby. Again, a real protagonist. Great riding, as you said, by the United States. The five riders that qualified, Lizzie Brook, oh, sorry, that's the United, the United Kingdom. It's Ariel Viharan, Alexi Snova, Kristin Kulczynski, who'll be very happy with that. Uh, been working on a, a sprint, as we heard, and Liz Van Hoerling. The five riders from Great Britain, Lizzie Brook, Lou Bates, Lucy Harris, and Mary Wilkinson, and Zoe Langham. Very interesting here from Zoe Langham. She is a junior doctor, of course, in Nottingham. The last time I spoke to her, she was, she'd just come off another shift. Amazing how she packs it in, but uh, interesting what Nathan was saying. She is one of the most versatile riders here. She can do it all, can't she? So she'll, I think she'll really revel in this format. I think she will. She was able to get over to a training camp over in Spain uh, at the early part of January. So she's had that short part to try and really get some, some endurance in the legs and then has spent where possible after, after work to, to try and... Uh, maintain that intensity into her training and she she had said well the the recovery isn't like what she would have had in in the past so it's incredible that she has has got to the start line she's been a little bit under the weather feeling a little bit ill over the past week so she's she's made it here she's made it into the next 30 and and Zoe Langham she said I'm better than I was last year. Yeah, that was and <laughs> wow. Well, great if you to hear. it is it is great to hear. It's that confidence and, and, and knowing that she's capable of of doing so. And if she's better than she was a year ago, well, watch out. Indeed, right, we're on to the lower slopes of the climb for the very first time. This is the Segur Summit from the north, 1.5 kilometres long, average gradient of 3.5 percent, but it does max out at a rather high 13%, and it's a very uneven climb. There's even a descent midway through. It drops down before it then kicks up again. We talked about it earlier on in the men's race. It's a hard climb to judge as we look, picture within picture. Look at the focus on the face of the American Liz Van Hooling there. Eyes firmly fixed in front. One rider just starting to get distance just at the back of this group, so a very, very good pace is being set at the moment. Jackie Godby, never far away from the front. Alexis Snova also there as well. Worth giving a shout out to one rider from Slovenia who's qualified, Laura Simench, also one from France, Sandrine Etienne, and one from Norway, Emma Julie Dreyhovden, and two from Canada, Marlene Lawson and Monalee Keller, who we've uh, seen regularly racing over the last few years on Zwift. There's a lot of very, very good riders in this field. Of course, the defending champion, Louis Adahays, qualified nicely inside the top 10. And uh, I am really, really liking this format, I, I must admit. 
It's uh, very, very different indeed. But the rods have got to adapt. And I think the important thing about this about this change and shift away from more the road format is that the eSports has to find at some point, Hannah, its own identity. And I think this is the first real step in that direction. It's still cycling, but it's just different. It's finding its own niche, isn't it? And also finding a, a, a way in which riders have to train and adapt their training very almost very differently uh, to be able to recover it's, it's it's similar i would say to track racing an omnium, omnium for yeah, example totally. where you don't have too much time between races to be able to recover and i think that is a, a key point here for the riders but also the, the the with it being a new world and all riders not having months and months or a couple of years to race and train on this very uh, very world that it's also very new you've had to adapt and learn the the, the world very quickly in it's the, the same in the for everybody and totally. so I, I think that's the beauty of it um and and finding its own way of the three different races it's uh tactically totally and of course um these riders have had an opportunity to ride in this world because kristin kulczynski doing what we expected she wants to make this race as hard as possible and she just crosses the line in p1 over the top, out of the saddle, in that real distinctive style that she's made her very own. And interesting, she doesn't ride a lot outdoors. She's really one of the finest riders in esports. Got a very unique style. Is able to push ridiculously high power, but has this low cadence, high torque technique, which is really made her own. And I think she's going to want to make this as hard as possible without pushing herself into the red. But doing it on a climb like that, she's making sure that everybody is starting to suffer a little bit. She doesn't want to take anybody fresh to the line and just mistime the sprint. This is her style of what we've seen so far. She led all the way up that climb. She knows that she can potentially snap the elastic on the climb. And if she creates such a hard pace on, on the climb and keeps um, the, the, the watts and the, and the power being laid down and really puts people under pressure, that's where she's going to really start to thrive here. Whilst riders on the uh, the climbs and even on the descents, they're going to want to try and hold and maintain their positions um, as, as opposed to taking a moment to almost get some rest and respite on the descents. Indeed. Well, we've got one rider drop. There's 29 left. 10 to go through. Tanya Erath, unfortunately, of Germany has uh, been dropped. So we've got 29 riders in this front group. Unfortunately, not too sure what happened to Tanya there. Occasionally, we do get uh, technical issues as we get uh, technical issues and mechanicals in the real world. But Zoe Langham on the front there, just setting the tempo and uh, rolling straight through to the front is uh, Mali Brunner of uh, Germany. Again, a relatively steady two watts a kilo here. This is, again, very, very tactical. They're looping back round, and this now is then not much rest at all. They're back up the climb from the other direction here. Just taking a look at Zoe Langham here in our uh, picture and picture and just how calm, cool and collected she looks. Looks very relaxed, very in control, that focus. Yeah, she's looking good, isn't she? A great shot there, almost angelic looking with the light behind her, her blonde flowing locks out the saddle there. Quite an iconic look there. Jackie Godby also moving through to the front. Again, a Godby very, very crisp acceleration she has when she's going well. She's setting a good tempo at the front, and clearly the Americans, you'd imagine, have spoken together. The way that Godby's riding here, they clearly want to make this hard. Of course, these riders want to win this individually, but they also want to make sure that they win it. As we go back to Glasgow. Here's Lizzie Brooke, the triathlete and Ironman. She's been a, uh, a world champion in the past, but in her... Uh, Triathlon. Yeah, good shot there. Uh, top, fully on zip, trying to keep as cool as possible. That's the thing here. We talked about it earlier on. And these are, these are basics, aren't they? Riding on Zwift, you're indoors. You really, really cannot um, uh, underestimate how important it is to keep that core body temperature down. A lot of riders have double fans on, uh, making sure they're taking on a lot of fluid. Back up the climb. Right round, we're coming towards the top now, 3.7 k's to go. Remember, all of these riders have got the anvil. We haven't seen one dropped just yet. Another feeling very similar to the men's race. And these women would have watched the men's race earlier on with keen interest as Godby sets that tempo at the front. This is hard, just under six watts a kilo, putting these riders under pressure as they round through the finish time. Next time they pass through the line in the other direction, uh, we will know the 10 riders that are going to pass through. So they really do plummet down the other side. This is a steep, steep descent. Who 
will deploy the anvil and at what point will they do it? It's the best part of a minute descending the anvil they have for 30 seconds. And I think at this point, it's it's not deploying the anvil too early. Yeah. As soon as you start to to make that descent, it's it's about timing it right so that you're able to benefit from the full 30 seconds so that you're not onto the the plateau already and you've still got the anvil, which is, is running. Um, and as you start to see, a flurry of anvils are now deployed by the majority of riders. You can see just above their heads, as some riders into that aero took making use of the speed that they're taking down on this descent here and riders also wanting to try and maintain their position a few riders starting to Indeed. get caught out here yep we've got an anvil blizzard going on an anvil tornado um it is a real tornado at the front remember this is a long power up this one 30 seconds makes you 50 kilograms lighter we saw it before in the men's race if you get dropped off the wheel while the anvil's being dropped by a group of riders in front we saw several key riders get dropped and the same has happened there this group has been thinned out jackie godby is one of the riders one of the pre-race favorites caught out in the dust that's been kicked up this is the gravel section that we talked about earlier on this is very very hard for one rider to try and get back in contact she's going to have to go very deep to get to to latch back onto the group. This is could potentially, Hannah, cost her dearly. It could, and this is her burning her matches here. She just had to make such a huge effort that she was above 10 watts per kilogram, and that is eating into those energy resources, eating into what you've got left in, in the tank. She's going to make it on by the looks of things, but what is that going to cost her as we start to climb again? She's almost uh, got herself latched back on. Is she now going to try and go straight past these riders and really draw things out at the moment while she's got that speed, the power, that momentum as things are being drawn out on the front from the British rider Mary Wilkinson. Well, Mary Wilkinson straight to the front. Good ride in there by Jackie Gobby. For a brief moment, she could just back off a little bit. Meanwhile, the two Brits at the front, Mary Wilkinson and Zoe Langham driving hard. Four and a half, five watts a kilo. Lou Bates also moving through to the front. Not too far away, Kristen Korczynski, the main animator in lap number one. The first time up this climb, 1,200 metres to go and still the steepest part of the climb to come. Near the top, Mary Wilkinson driving hard. This is the sort of race she wants. She's, she has the ability to go long. Remember, the holy grail in eSports is that one-minute power, and this is where you need to deploy it. This is where Mary Wilkinson will really start to thrive because she's got that kick, she's got that acceleration, but she's a tremendous climber. We've seen her do hill climbs here in the UK on many occasions. She was part of that Zwift Academy, Academy Finals a few years back, but here comes Lou Bates, also Zoe Langham. There's a flurry of British riders up towards the front. Also, Liz van Hooling coming up, as well as Los Arachis, the defending champion, the Dutch woman who is sitting currently in fifth place. Well, only 10 spots in the final up for grab. The next round is the podium where the rainbow jersey will be fought for. It all rests on the next 700 metres. This is the climb. 30 riders started out. Only 10 will go through to battle it out for the iconic rainbow bands. Bates, Wilkinson, Langham, at haste. The defending world champion is there. They've still got a couple of hairpins to go, 500 metres to go. And the group now, Hannah, starting to fragment. It's starting to fragment. You can see Lou Bates, Langham, Kulczynski are starting to see a little little bit of daylight. Meanwhile, we've got the, the riders from Sweden. There's a flurry of riders from Sweden who are starting to struggle with this pace with 400 metres to go there. There's Godby, also Verharden. She's in great form at the moment, but she needs to get herself within the top 10. Also, Melanie Maurer. Uh, just coming round into the final corner here. The finish line will come into sight very, very shortly. What a fantastic shot we've got as the road starts to kick, kick up again. Zoe Langham, Verharden, Bruni, Brook in Etienne. We're looking at a very unusual shot of the group as they thunder through 200 metres to go. Langham is there, Kuczynski, out of haste, open things up. She wants to make sure she gets through to the final from the Netherlands. Look at the raw power of the defending champion. Kristen Kuczynski qualifies too. Uh, Führer is there, Godby, Langham, Etienne. Etienne Söderström, Bates, Brook and Van Hooling. They are the first 10. They are the riders that will qualify for the final round of the eSports World Championships and the podium. That was very, very hard. You can see the pressure being applied early on to really make that selective. Wow. I mean, you could just see how difficult and the effort that was required on the climb there because Lizzie Brooke here is gasping and gulping for air and oxygen being cheered on there by Natalie Stevenson the local rider and you can just see heartbreak for oh. Brooke finishing in 11th position 
She well, really has left everything on the line, and and this is what it takes in in the uh, in the climb. Utter, utter heartbreak. Yep. Look how deep these riders went. Well, it's loose Adigeis. Um, this is Zoe Langham on the floor there. So Adigeis, Kuczynski, Langham, Vahar and Fura, Godby, Soderstrom, Etienne, Bates, Van Hooling, and Lizzie Brook. Uh, Lizzie Brook, unfortunately, not qualifying. So our 10 riders are through to the final round. For now, breathless off the Hannah, it's back to Dan and Nathan in the studio. It's real edge of your seat stuff, isn't it? Very, very tense out there. Uh, former world champion Lush Adigeist of the Netherlands with the win in that one, crossing the line first. Zoe Langham very prominent as well. And I feel so bad for you, Lizzie Brook. Please do not eat yourself up about that. 11th place, absolutely gutting. Uh, Nathan was so far towards the edge of his seat that I thought at one point he was going to actually come <laughs> off the front of it. Uh, Jackie Godby is the first rider I'd like to talk about. She was pressing on right from the very beginning, as you predicted. She was pressing on over the top of the second climb of that round. Then she got dropped on the descent, had a massive chase to get back on. What's interesting is we actually saw that in the men's race as well, where the first rider over the top of that uh, last descent actually found themselves a little bit toward the back because of that roll through speed of the pack. And so I was worried she wasn't going to make it through. She ended up in sixth, it looked like. But after having to put that kind of an effort in just to get back on terms at the bottom of the climb before mm. it started, she's lucky they didn't go bottom to top, kind of full gas. It is one of those climbs that evens out a little bit. You can find a draft. Looks like she was able to recover and pull a punch through. It also speaks to how much fitness she has right now to be able to pull that off. It does, yeah. She recovered on round two to finish in the top ten in sixth place there. Has that taken out too much from her, do you think, though, going into the final round? Let's just remind people that we've got one rider being eliminated every half a lap on that final round. Do you think she's going to pay for that effort? Her heart rate was like 186 or something with the chase back on. Yeah, she'll pay for the effort. The question is, is she that level above that she can recover from it and come back in? She's been in this situation before many times. She is the kind of athlete that I think that can recover. She's also been a triathlete you know, in the past. I think uh, she'll most likely have the engine. It is, though, those small percentages in world championships like this, and it looks like uh, Verharin, Kroczynski, Adegist, all really on form, who finished ahead of her. So um, we'll have to see in the crit coming up. Mm, Kroczynski right up there in second place as well, so she's on top, top form. Right then, let's take a look at the all-important results, and therefore the top ten riders who will be going through to the final round. Uh, Adegist, as mentioned, first across the line ahead of Kroczynski. Zoe Langer of Team GB in third. Ariel Verharin, also of the USA, one of four riders, in fact, from the USA going through to the final. Uh, Catherine Furrer of Switzerland, also up there in fifth place. Jackie Godby, the aforementioned rider from the US in sixth. Mika Söderström in seventh place for Sweden. Sandrine Etienne of France in eighth. Lou Bates of Team GB, great ride from her to come ninth. And the final qualifier, Liz Van Hooling of the USA in tenth place. Any surprises of the riders who have gone through and any surprises of the eliminations for you in this round? Well, taking a look at this, it is going to be that Catherine Furr actually getting through out of Switzerland. She's kind of new to the community racing and has been a name that's popped up in the Zwift Racing League a lot. We actually said, oh, this is a new all-star maybe on the rise. Well, she's definitely proven that hitting this top 10 right here. On not making it, Molly Keller is a big name there. We're also seeing Mary Wilkinson, obviously Lizzie Brooke, uh, Merle Bruni. Those are names I was definitely expecting maybe able to make it through. Sandrine Etienne, she's not a name I'm very familiar with at all. So that is a big breakthrough ride and someone that may be popping up out of the community. Yeah, Sandrine Etienne from France there. Brilliant ride from her to get through to the final. How do you think the final is going to play out? Uh, for those of you, incidentally, who weren't watching in the men's race, we'll go through what the course looks like and how the elimination process runs. But how would you expect the women to play? And in particular, you know, the likes of Kulczynski, who maybe not, is not quite as punchy as some of the other, other riders, they'll have been watching the men's race, weren't they, where Bjorn Andreasen went off the front from the very beginning and held everybody off. Who's the most likely of our top 10 to try something similar? Because it's a risk, isn't it? It's a huge risk. But like I said, Kolchinski, that's her favorite place to be. If she finds herself off the front and it's enough of a gap, if they really let her go, she's just going to dance on the pedals and love that position. She's not going to want it. She's not going to want that pressure. She's also, I think, the type of person who doesn't want that pressure. Mm. She just wants to be in her own favorite place to be on the bike, and that's hammering off the front. Doing, like she said, she loves those 20-minute efforts. She's not going to want world championship coming to the line. Yeah. 
Yeah, and there's four USA rides in the final. Team Tactics could come to play it as well. We'll have to wait and see uh, once we get there. I'm not sure exactly how long it is until the final round, but it's not long. Very short breaks and recovery periods between each one. Uh, now, though, we're going to hear from Lizzie Brook, who's up there in Glasgow. So I'm now joined with Lizzie Brooks. Oh my word, Lizzie, that was so close. I mean, the whole room was screaming, shouting. We really thought you were gonna get in, but 11, how do you feel? Oh, um, gutted, but like, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it and absolutely everything went down. I couldn't have done any better. So I'm like, I'm pleased with myself for trying. Um, at the point of the top bit when everyone kicked, I just shut my eyes and put everything left down. So. When I last saw it, it said fourth, so I thought I was probably safe, and I heard my husband shouting, go on, and it was like, I knew it was going to be really close, so I didn't even want to look until I was over the line. That was my, I think I probably hit some PBs today, so yeah, I can't really complain. I mean, the places were changing so quickly, as you said, you were like in fourth, and then you were like 11th, but talk us through the atmosphere in this room. What has it been like? You know, it's not really your average kind of setup that you're used to. Yeah, it, honestly, it doesn't feel like a Zwift race. Like it feels like a world championship. It feels, you know, you can feel the crowd, you can feel the energy. Um, it's definitely given me an advantage uh, in terms of the adrenaline, I think. Um, and it just makes you take it more seriously. So, yeah, I really loved it. Yeah, it's been great. But one more race to go now. A few GP teammates left in there, so we'll head back to you in the studio. Nothing more that she could have given and some PBs along the way, so she cannot be at all disappointed with not going through to the final, Lizzie Brooke. Uh, yes, this final, I loved watching it in the men's race. I think it's a great format that we're seeing, but you can't afford to sort of ease yourself into it, can you? Because that first elimination is after 1.6 kilometres. Yeah, the racers can make the race, though. There are so many opportunities on this course. We've got that Clyde kicker doubled up on that, and then right after the Clyde kicker, you've got a couple bumps that you can even give with some speed there. Then, with the eliminations being so often, there's just so many opportunities for the racers to play cards and not really just sit and look at each other so mm. much if they do. It really was interesting how it played out in that first race with the men's. I'm not sure we're going to see something very much like that. There might be some other plans from the women. Yes, well, we'll see very shortly indeed. Uh, for those of you who didn't watch the men's race earlier on, we're going to remind you of what the third and final round looks like in terms of the map. Uh, it is still very short as a race, as they all are. I keep getting caught out by how quickly we come back here into the studio. But but there is two eliminations per lap, so the first of those comes after just half a lap. As you can see, there's 12.3 kilometers long in total. Not flat at all, with 133 meters of elevation gain. The biggest climb comes at the midway point, where the first elimination happens. But as Nathan was just saying, it's not flat there at the finish either. So seven elimination points, and then we'll be down to just the three riders with half a lap to go, who will decide the podium places between them. And we'll find out very shortly indeed who is going to be the second rider of this evening to take home the rainbow bands and be able to ride in them on Zwift for the next 12 months or so. It's going to be very exciting indeed. Uh, how, who is your favourite for this win at this point, having seen what you've seen, and has that favourite changed for you versus what your thoughts were coming into this race? Well, Jackie Gabby, you go to the line with Jackie Gabby as we saw, full second in the uh, first race. She was able to take over the line. And the only thing is if somebody does get away and they sit up and they start looking at each other, the other thing is a lot of the favorites are on the same team nationally. And so will Jackie sit in and let Kristen go? I mean, they can play some games here and they've got some good hitters. And so it's going to play out maybe a little bit similar to what we saw with the men from Denmark, letting their teammate go and mm. they just didn't do any work. How much communication will there be between the riders from the USA? A lot. Actually, uh, Matt Gardner's the DS, uh, and then we've got Jen Reel. So those are the two DSs, and we had them on actually a podcast this past week, and they are uh, a very well-oiled machine. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I think I have a feeling amongst all of the teams in the world, they might be one of the most tightly knit. They do race each other on opposite trade teams a lot, but that's all just going to, I think, come together to try and bring the Rainbow and Bands home. I was actually over in Monaco with Philippe Gilbert recently. He said one of the reasons that Quick Step on the road is so successful is because they've got so many big name riders 
they want to get out front first because they don't want to be left behind having to sit in the wheels and watch their teammates go up the road. I'm wondering whether it could be quite similar when we see the women's race with the four rides from the USA coming up very, very shortly indeed. So, to remind you, we now have just 10 riders left with a chance of becoming the 2023 UCI Cycling eSports World Champion. It's a very short course, there's no warming up, they're going to be straight in with a bang. The first elimination after just 1.6 kilometres, and then with half a lap to go, we will have just three riders remaining. I cannot wait for it to start, we've got just over a minute until we does. So now I'll hand you back to our commentators. Thank you very much, Dan. This is it. This is the podium. We started off with 86 riders, went down to 30, and now we have 10 for the final. This is elite race number three for the women. On the streets of Glasgow, this is the Glasgow Crit Circuit, featuring the fearsome climb of the Clyde Kicker and also the Champions Sprint. Hannah, breathless racing, selective racing, but we have got an amazing lineup. I mean, it's a who's who of esports, isn't it? The riders that we've been commentating over the last few years, the defending champions, some real likable characters of this sport, but all of them with something different to offer and thrown into the mix, four riders from the USA. It's incredible, isn't it? And when you take a look at the 10 riders who make up this final race, they all have very different attributes. They all have very different um, ways in which they could go on to take the victory here. So it's, it's going to be very, very interesting, and it'll be interesting to see um, how things play out. Will, they try, will one rider try and go early? What will be the tactics from the USA? Also within GB, uh, you've got Zoe Langham, who, despite saying that she felt a little bit under the weather the past week, she was looking incredibly strong in the, uh, the second race. And then Cedrine Etienne, the sole representative from France, a little bit of uh, work to make up at the moment because things are going very, very fast off the front here. Kristen Kulczynski of the USA and Los Arachist are trying to split things up here because you saw their numbers on our screens just go into the uh, orange there to show the power was being put down. Yep, well, they're going through the arch here. This is when they'll get their first burrito as uh, Sandrine Etienne had to work really hard, as you said. She's carried so much speed. She's gone straight through that short group. And there they are all up. It's worth going through the names because in 16 and about 1,000 metres time, we'll be getting our first riders eliminated. The defending champion of the Netherlands is there, Lois Adderhaste. One rider from Sweden, Mika Soderstrom. Lou Bates and Zoe Langham representing Great Britain. Um, the Ariel Vaharen. Christian Kuczynski and Jackie Godby and Liz Van Hooling of the United States of America. Then we have Catherine Führer of Switzerland and the aforementioned Sandrine Etienne of France. That is your group. Well, will this be a tactical one? Will somebody go long? There was a little inkling there that Christian Kuczynski just wanted to test, just to put people on the back foot and go long. That's the, if she's going to win, that's the way she needs to ride it. Isn't and it? that did certainly put some riders under pressure there because you saw it was such a hard, fast start. And as you see, does she have a slight little gap here? I think she's going to to try and go long here. She does have one second of an advantage over Zoe Langham, but we already saw that Cedrian Etienne was, was finding herself off the back at the very beginning, and that was a big effort to try and get herself back into contention and drawing things out here at the moment, Kulczynski. Who's going to chase? Because at the moment, there's no real concerted effort or chase from those behind. Well, this is the first time up the Clyde kick-up. Kulczynski on the front, she got a little bit of a lead there, but great riding by her teammates there, Vaharan, Godby and Hooling. They just drop back, forcing Zoe Langham to chase. Kulczynski drops into the slipstream of the American. Etienne moves up on the left-hand side, Fura rolls through. So, uh, uh, so I think there's going to be no elimination this time through. So it would, uh, looks like we've got a technical issue there. So uh, one rider has actually dropped out, and that looks like it's Lou Bates. So one rider has been uh, dropped out. We'll get more information after the race. So no elimination this time through, but Lou Bates has dropped out. So it's still as you were. There are nine riders left in the mix, the first nine riders there, but nobody still has managed to break clear. This, that little kicker, 
before we turn right and right again. And we head back down to the champion sprint. So next time through the champion sprint, though, we will get another rider eliminated. So this is it. Uh, next time through, one rider will go through. Who is going to get eliminated? It kicks up. We've got a little bit of a right-hand turn. So we've got about 800 metres, give or take. Not much opportunity for recovery, especially after the brutally steep Clyde kicker. It certainly is, and this will be the first chance for riders to get a power-up as well, and that will be another burrito. So they'll be able to get a, a burrito power-up every lap through the champion sprint. will also be every half a lap having that elimination. It certainly puts the pressure on it, uh, the tactics. Where where are you in the, uh, the pack? And making sure you're watching the other riders. What are the numbers on the screen saying? But also making sure that you're playing into, into your hands. And there's a, there's a part a few hundred meters before you get to that champion sprint, which is also our finish line, where he starts to kick up. And it can really catch a few riders out. Yeah, they get, uh, they'll be in sight in a few moments time, just around this little chicane. And they got a bit of a kick at, then they were swing left. So still all together. Uh, the four Americans, remember, in this group. Christian Kulczynski, Van Hulen, Godby and Verhalen. Then we've got uh, Etienne of France. And also playing a very canny game. The only rider through from Sweden is at Mika Söderström. She hasn't done anything on the front. It's really is starting to slow down. This is proper tactical. Uh, you can see the power numbers just dropping a little bit. Still riding along quite nicely. 2.9 kilometers done. Here's that left-hand turn. And then you'll just see the road drop down, and here comes the sprint. They should pick things up now. One rider will be eliminated this time through. And they've done a really slow start there. They've picked it up very, very late indeed. It is Kulczynski who drops a power up there. Is she going to get swamped on the line? Well, this is going to be fascinating stuff. Kulczynski is drifting back. Fura goes past. Who's going to get dropped? It is indeed. Oh, I think we might be... Van Hooling, I think it was, or Kulczynski will get confirmation. I have a feeling it is Kulczynski. Well, that is a big, big disappointment. She dropped to Burrito and then slid back through the group. One of the pre-race favourites is now out. So the Americans reduced to three riders out front and we now have eight riders left. Well, that is a well big disappointment for the American team. A huge disappointment. And I think a huge disappointment for Crystal Kulczynski because it looked like she was so in control that she started to open up her, her sprint or an acceleration just that little bit too late. And, and you saw it was almost a, uh, a drag race between the, the two riders from the USA, Liz Van Hooling and Kristel Kaczynski. And it was Kaczynski at the very last moment who uh, unfortunately crossed the line in the, uh, the ninth position overall. So she's finished ninth in this World Championships, but I think Top 10 again, but we'll be, it will be severely disappointed there. It will be. It won't be very long though before we get another rider eliminated. We've got this little bit of a kick up, then it drops down, and then we commence the next ascent of the Clyde kicker where somebody will be dropped. Jackie Godby on the front there, Soda Strom midway through. Everybody across the road here. And nobody wanting to take things up at the moment, but I have a feeling somebody might want to. But with Kulczynski out of the mix, she was one of the riders you knew couldn't afford to leave it to a sprint, and she paid for it there. We knew that she uh, wanted to go along. She put a big effort in the Clyde kicker before, but unfortunately, um, there's riders with that little bit more of a sprint. Adegais, the defending champion, on the back, making sure she's got sight of everybody as Jackie Godby starts to wind things up for the sprint now. And you see Jackie Godby putting down the uh, the power at the moment, seven watts per kilogram at the moment. She's uh, looking towards a one-second lead over Zoe Langham and Sadrine Etienne. As things start to open up, Langham again opens it up for Great Britain. At the moment, Vaharen hot on her heels in third place at the moment, but at the back, it's going to be Liz Van Hooling of the USA who is eliminated. Another one bites the dust. Lid van Hurling has been eliminated on the climb of the Clyde kicker. Two successive members of the American team. They still have two riders out in front, though, in the form of Jackie Diop, Godby and Ariel Verharden. Also in the mix still there is Zoe Langham, Catherine Fura of Switzerland. Had a haste, of course, the defending champion in that uh, light orange and white kit. Looking very, very canny indeed as things slow just a little bit. Mika Soderstrom of Sweden rolls through to the front. Such an undulating course here. This is very, very tactical indeed. It looks like the riders here, from what we can see, are happy just to let it go down to a sprint. Um, just by the way they're riding at the moment suggests to me that these riders are relatively confident, uh, confident, uh, confident in the punch that they've got rather than trying to go long. And of course, with two American riders eliminated, it gives them less options too. And it, it takes away from that, that pure 
team effort from from the USA, having now only two riders remaining in the, in the race. They were, they were in a really, really strong position having the four, but perhaps didn't quite utilize it to their advantage early on. However, we've had two very demanding races already. What has that taken out of the legs of these riders and how difficult uh, and intense has the racing been so far? Because uh, when uh, we're sitting here in our commentary booth, it's not a real representation of just how hard it is. You saw how hard the second race was from the facial expressions and uh, the body language of Lizzie Brook here. Oh, another little small rise. It's a real interesting circuit here. Four laps in total. It's around three kilometers. A big climb every lap, and there's a couple of nasty little kickers as well, and this is getting very, very cagey. The seventh rider across the line, as you can see on the left-hand side, as we go through the champion sprint, will be eliminated. Will it be Langham, Godby, Führer, Adegast, Soderstrom, or Vaharan? Two Americans, a English, uh, a British rider, a French rider, and a Swiss, as well as a Swede in the mix. And you can just see the finish line coming up. It is Jackie Godby, who drops the burrito. Ada Haste opened things up on the right-hand side. She's certainly going to qualify. It looks like one of the riders at the back is going to get dropped here. Is it Fura, Soderstrom, or Godby? It looks like it's going to be the Swiss rider, unless she can find something special on the line. Oh, it's very tight, but it looks like it was Fura there of Switzerland. Catherine Fura is the next rider to be eliminated and we are down to six riders out in front. 5.9 k's to go and only one rainbow jersey. You can see how close it's becoming for those eliminations, especially across the champion sprint, where it really does come down to that pure power that you have and that acceleration, because they're coming from slower speeds. They're coming into this where your your immediate acceleration really is crucial here, as opposed to on the Clyde kicker, where those who have a, a very strong sort of 30 second power output really thrive on, on the Clyde kicker, Jackie Godby, Zoe Langham being two of those. Los Arachis yesterday, I was keeping a close eye on her pre-race activation and what she was doing as a, uh, a warm-up ahead of today. And she'd done this climb in 26 seconds. She was the fastest time out of everybody. There was 480 uh, riders, male and female, out on the course, and she was wow. the fastest of everybody up that climb. So she really had opened up the... Uh, opened up the afterburners there. Yep, and she's not taking any chances. She's opened up the sprint quite early each time. And if you open up the sprint early and open up a gap, as long as you maintain it, you don't need to push any further. You don't need to fight. So she's clearly the quickest, but it suggests to me that she's almost holding back. She doesn't need to go full because she's able to open up. She's got such a strong initial acceleration. She then holds that and doesn't need to push. She's got that much of an initial, initial kick. That's what she's got in her armory. And I also think it's that confidence in herself. She's come into the 2023 season with her world tour outfit, her trade team on the road of uh, FDJ Suez, having won the Cadell Evans road race, a uh, women's world tour yeah, yeah. race, Incredible. beating two exceptional riders and she knows that the form is there well here we go next time up this is the Clyde kicker we'll be down to five who's it going to be Vaharan is the rider just at the back there Godby is dropping back it looks like Vaharan's going to roll Godby a teammate on the line no it's actually going to be that's the Swede that goes it looks like it's going to be Mika Soderstrom or is it on the lines of Burrito that's been dropped on the left oof Sandrine Etienne just made it deployed her Burrito to utter perfection wow so no draft allowed there. So it meant that uh, Mika Soderstrom has been dropped. We've got five riders left in front. Great Britain. We've got the United States of America. We've got France and the Netherlands. But it is advantage USA in terms of team riders. They've got two in the mix, Godby and Baharan. This is absolutely fascinating, Hannah. 4.3 kilometers to go. Three medals, but only one rainbow jersey and two more eliminations along the way. And the next one's going to come up very quickly at Champion Sprint again. So, well, yeah, this is quite stressful, isn't it? It's thrillingly entertaining, but they're leaving it to the last. That was very, very close indeed. Sad to see Mika Soderstrom go, but great riding. I mean, the most, the unknown quantity here for me is, is uh, Sandrine Etienne. Brilliant riding by the by the French woman here. She stayed in the mix, picking them off. Vaharan, Godby, Langham, and Lewis Adahaste. As you said, a magnificent win. 
That was a world tour race that she won. She's just got so much of an acceleration. She hasn't just got that kick, but what she's able to do is sustain it. She can go short and she can go long. She's so versatile. And also she tactically, the way where, when you see her race, where she makes her move, where she puts down her effort, where she's able to conserve her energy and really become almost anonymous within within the pack i think that was very telling in race one almost race two as well that she she was confident in her ability and she knew that uh, she could come in here with confidence as the defending champion knowing that the form was there knowing that she's already had a a top level win already this season and knowing that she can be one of the best exactly she's got the rainbow bands on and taking that win at world tour level it was a stunning stunning victory as you said for the ftz Suez team now it's in etienne goes clear good move sandrine etienne got caught out nearly last time but she's gone long 11 watts a kilo there ava haste is in her slipstream and the rider who's suffering at the moment at the back is Vaharden and Jackie Godby. So the two Americans are under pressure. Nice use of the burrito there by the defending champion. It's going to be Vaharen. Vaharen is eliminated. This time through the champion sprint, four riders left in the mix. And unfortunately for the United States of America, it is Ariel Vaharen who has gone. So we have Jackie Godby, Zoe Langham, Lois Adahaste are left in the mix. <sighs> Fascinating stuff. This is one more rider to be eliminated, and then it'll be the battle for the rainbow bands. Nobody has gone clear. A very, very different race than what we saw in the men. This is really tactical now. Can Etienne recover from that effort that she put out at the moment? Heart rate at 168, Los Araheast at 177, Langham at 180 beats per minute, Jackie Godby at 181, and these riders. It's almost watching each other so closely, so carefully. Who will be the first to make a move on this uh, Clyde kicker at the moment? <sighs> what permutation will it be? Uh, red, white and blue of America, of Great Britain, of France or of the Netherlands. <laughs> Absolutely and fascinating stuff. And it won't be long before we know who's going to be the podium, but not who's going to get the rainbow bands. The beauty of this is there's no teamwork to, to be had. There's no, no. Uh, alliances that can be formed here. We've got four riders, four different federations, the Netherlands, Great Britain, France, and the USA. This is all on the line for a world champion's jersey to become the world champion for one year to have those rainbow bands. This is fascinating on the streets of virtual Glasgow. The crit circuit, this is the final race. We started off with 86 riders from all over the world in the women's racing. We've had 26 nations represented. It has been a wonderful celebration of cycling. It really has. The third edition of the East Cycling Esports World Championships. We're about to see another elimination up the Clyde Kicker. Langham goes long. Big acceleration by the British rider. 8.7 watts a kilo. At the moment, Los Adahis, she starts to accelerate very late. And Godby, she at the moment, she's got some work to do to be able to try and come round Adahis at the moment. Adahis at 12.8 watts per kilogram. She's coming back through. Is it going to be Etienne who gets eliminated? Oh, it's close on the line but yeah Etienne 45 year old from France is eliminated well great riding there by Sandrine Etienne to be in with the last four riders but it is her it looked as if she was going to hold on but a wonderful bit of riding timing there from Jackie Godby she is now in a medal winning position and Godby's actually gone straight through to the front there as if she wants to take it over the top 1.4 k's to go now Zoe Langham rolls through onto the wheel of Adahaste. Next time through, we will know who is going to be the world champion. Would it be Jackie Godby of the United States in their position three? Would it be Zoe Langham, the trainee doctor working in Nottingham? Or will it be a Jackie Godby of the United States of America? Adahaste, Godby and Langham, two of the finest riders out there. Riders with big Palmares and certainly know how to how to ride on Swift. They certainly do. Los Adakis coming in as that defending champion. Godby, an incredibly experienced Swifter. The 32-year-old from the USA. You can just see her on the fluorescent blue Tron bike at the moment. Zoe Langham, the 24-year-old from Great Britain. She's in a position of trying to take her first world title at the moment. And this is it. Godby goes, moves through to the front. Langham 
in second position. Only a couple of bends to go now. Ada Hayes, the defending champion of the Netherlands, sat sitting, the, sitting in the wheel of the American, who is going to be the rider to open things up first. It's almost like a track sprint coming in to the closing few hundred metres, a small rise in the road, and then a little shimmy and a couple more turns, and then they will see the champion sprint out in front. It looks like it's Ada Haste leading, leading things out now. Godby rolls through to the front. Lange, Langham just dropping back a little bit. Looks like Godby wants to wind this one up. Doesn't want to leave it till too late. Is that Langham now rolls through? A couple more, one more corner to go. They're going to swing left and then they'll drop down and then he will see the finishing banner in front of them. Godby dropping back at haste on the right hand side. Who was the rider that opened it up first? Langham rounding that final bend. They can soon see it. And there we go. Langham opens it up first. Out of haste, accelerates through the defending champion. Langham has got a nice little bit of a lead, but out of haste, despite the dropping of a burrito, out of haste, steams past on the right-hand side. Well, undeniably the fastest rider. Undeniably an expert on the esports platform. It is Lois Adahaste who punches the air with delight. The defending champion is in the rainbow bands once more. Well, you saw there from Lois Adahaste, she left it late. She rushed the gap to Zoe Langham. You see already the flag has been dropped. She's got it round her shoulders and she has defended successfully her world title. She's Already into the rainbow stripes well, that was there. A very, uh, that was a, a very, very quick change, wasn't it? Uh, wonderful stuff. She played an absolute blinder there. She really, really did. And I apologise just once more for our picture break up there. But there's the winner. The defending champion is in the stripes again. I was keeping an eye on her power numbers into that final sprint. 15.2 watts oh, per kilogram. Isn't it? There's no wonder the, uh, the gap in which she won by and... Incredible racing there in race three to the podium. Back to the studio. Our second world champion of the evening has just been crowned and it's back-to-back -back wins at the UCI Cycling Esports World Championships for Lush Adekest of the Netherlands. And what a brilliant job she did at the end there. Again, like Matt said, apologies for the picture breakup on the live broadcast, but at least we got to watch the replay and exactly how it played out right at the end there. Uh, still with me in the studio is Nathan. Your thoughts on those final three? I mean, you first said to me, Jackie Godby just left it too late to kick for the line. Yeah, I really, it was interesting to me how, was it nerves? I'm not sure, but I mean, she's got the kick to match, I, I believe. Or was it the fact that she had to come over the top of Etienne on the Clyde kicker? You know, going back through the race, and the way I said she was kind of like a bull in a china shop, the way that she was riding, and we saw her burn the match on race number two. So it come down to she just didn't have much energy mm. left, but she definitely left it late to follow the wheels. Zoe jumping, it was a little bit of a lead out in my opinion. And Lois, I mean, tactically and power wise, she was the best athlete on the day. Yeah, when we were watching, we were both saying how smart Lewis Adegast was playing it the whole way through. She's obviously incredibly powerful as well. And we've mm -hmm. seen that on the road this year. She's joined the FDJ Suez team. She's taken a win at World Tour level at Cadell Evans Great Ocean Road Race. But almost because of that success on the road, there were more question marks mm -hmm. hanging over you know, how she would do on the Zwift platform because it is such a different discipline. So short, so sharp, requiring really intense power over those short durations. But she's clearly very capable at both disciplines right now. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I, w I did have questions coming in too. I mean, she showed herself very powerful in the Zwift Grand Prix. She showed herself in the Zwift Racing League to be there, but was getting beat by a couple of her teammates this past week. But today, she knew how to show up on the right day at the right time. And you'd imagine Zoe Langham will be pleased with the silver medal in the final there. I mean, uh, we keep mentioning it, but she's got a very a job that takes up a lot of hours each week that she's training around. There wasn't really much she could have done different over the final, in particular in that final sprint, is there? Yeah, I mean, perhaps the lead out, she jumped really, really early. It might have got the nerves, might have gotten to her. But yeah, it, I think she'll be really happy. She said in her interview, I'm happy with any place. Well, a silver medal at World Championships is something to definitely be happy about. Mm. You have to feel sorry for Lou Bates, though out at the start with a technical problem. I mean, it can't get any worse than that. We'll revisit that just shortly. I think first up, though, uh, we are going to revisit the highlights of this third and final round from the women's races. Uh, trying to decide exactly which point we are at right now, but this looks like the finish line to me, Nathan. 
Yeah, that is the finish line. That's her coming across there. Look at that. The effort at first and then the elation afterwards. That is so great to see. And she won a dominate, an dominating performance there, as you can see. This is the second to last time over the top where Gabby just gets herself back involved as Etienne is taken out. That may be the point at which Gabby really put her winning move down. As you can see, she was immediately, though, out of the race in this, in this section as Lois just distances herself. There's a great ride there as well by Sandrine Etienne, wasn't it, from France? Not a very well-known rider, really. It wasn't mentioned between us before the start. She finished just outside the medals. Kristen Kolchinski, though, of the USA, one of the pre-race favourites, she made a move very early. Welcome back, Hannah. Thank and you. I think wanted to try and get up the road like we saw Bjorn Andreasen do a little bit earlier on today. It didn't work out for her. And for me, it felt like she paid for that effort when it came to the sprint that ultimately saw her out of the race. I think she did. It certainly was a difficult first two races. And we saw that from the body language of Lizzie Brooke after that second race and just how difficult and demanding it was. So I think perhaps paid for that effort in the third race, in the podium. Um, but I also think... A lot of the riders had come with not too much speed and having to make that immediate acceleration into the final 200 metres, if you've not got that explosiveness, you really paid for it. And mm. potentially, Kristen Kulczynski and almost Liz Van Hooling uh, paid for it as well. Yes, they did, unfortunately. Right, I think we can now speak to our winner, Lush Adekast in the Netherlands to find out her thoughts on the second consecutive win at the UCI Cycling Esports World Championships. First up, congratulations, of course, Lewis, how confident were you feeling coming into this race today? Uh, well, thank you. Um, I trained my sprint and I <coughs> and I know that the people are strong when we go more uh, good sprinters, but they do that all that and more about the fight, but yeah, I felt more in control and felt more confident. Well, unfortunately, we're having a little bit of break up. I'm not sure if you can hear me, but we're struggling to hear you at the moment. So we'll try and get you back shortly to have more of an interview a little bit later on. She must be over the moon, though, surely. I mean, the season start that she's had in 2023 is incredible. Total elation. It's, I think, carrying that confidence from the Cadell Evans road race over in Australia, a world tour victory where she beat Amanda Spratt in the sprint and Nina Boisman, and then going on to defend a world title. It's a fantastic start to the 2023 season for Low Shadow Haste, and I think can take a lot of confidence for the remainder of the season and her capabilities. And she's such an all-round rider as well who can, mm. who can climb very well. She's got that explosive sprint as we saw this evening and it's, it's quite remarkable, a, a remarkable talent. Yeah, there wasn't much weakness shown by her this evening, was there? What have we learned from this evening? Uh, that's a loaded question. In that I, <laughs> as in, Zwift has become such a specialist platform in esports in general and the bike. You know, there's a big differential. And I've heard Victor Campenart saying he wasn't expecting to get into the second round, which he didn't. This time next week, he's racing the opening weekend in Omloop Het Newsband. He'll be one of the favourites. That said, we've had a mountain biker win the men's race. We've had a former sort of specialist on Zwift win the women's race, who's now winning big races on the road as well. So, you know, how far has the separation come between Zwift racing? and in real world racing. Well, we've seen that uh, the Zwift racers, as we see with uh, you know, Jay Vine, now we see with Los Adegis, they're able to take it to the real world. Can it come over to Zwift? That, I think that's the question in some ways as well. Uh, but you know, we've obviously seen some amazing performances for Fede Ovid. We've seen amazing performances of Jason Osborne, who are also racing in real life. So it's a really good question. I think we still need some more years to figure it out. We're three years into world championships where there's really something to chase after. But with the way that Lois is showing up, and this is kind of like highlight moments of her probably her whole career as we see her winning over and over again, maybe it's going to be some more carrots to chase here in the mm. virtual world. Yeah, it's slightly more understandable that she had a rainbow jersey ready to put on and it was not, not, not taking anything away from Bjorn Andreasen earlier, but I did laugh when he had the champagne and the <laughs> rainbow jersey there. Where do you see this going in in the future do you think it'll become more separate and more specialist as we move on or will there be more crossover from the you know 
assuming in 10 years' time, a lot of the people that will be racing here in Zwift, they would have done so and ridden Zwift, whether they're road riders, mountain bikers, cyclocross, because it's such a good platform to train over the winter months. So do you see a conversion in it, or do you see it separating more as the years go on? I have to say, I think if it continues with this type of format with the three races and it's uh, an elimination race by race, I think I can see different riders cross over from different disciplines because as we saw from um, Bjorn Andreasen as a, a mountain biker, cyclocross rider, the, making it through the first two rounds I'd say with relative ease, it was of course very difficult, but he still kept his his name and, and himself very much under the radar. But then in the final um, final race where it was short, sharp, intense, it really favoured a rider who had that that intensity mm. within their, their makeup and, and physical abilities. And I wonder if some track riders will look at this format and think, this kind of goes hand in hand mm. with a, an omnium, a points race where you're constantly having to recover. Even some of the, the sprinters, perhaps, where I think it's short enough, 14 mm. kilometres at, at a maximum, uh, I think we could see a, a big crossover. Not sure Chris Hoy would agree with you. <laughs> it might be a little bit too long still for the pure sprints on the track. Could but be. you know, just in you general, know, so in, can... in 10 years' time, how, how will things change? Yeah, we'll have to wait until team pursuiters. In 10 years, yeah. I guess. We? But we're seeing more and more multidiscipline competitors in cycling, aren't we? I mean, it, there came a point probably about 10, 20 years ago where you were either a track rider or a mountain biker or a cyclocross rider or a road racer. Thankfully, over recent years, we're now seeing people doing multiple disciplines, the likes of Wout van Aert, Mathieu van der Poel, Lucinda Brand, etc., etc. And I guess Zwift can be factored into that as well. People just like having fun on the bike, and the more fun you have, the longer your career is going to be. Yeah, 100%. I think uh, this has also been a, speaking of how long careers are going to be. I mean, it's obviously a great launch pad that we've seen for these riders taking this on. Los, as we were saying, not really known that well at all until she took on that world championship. And then now, next thing you know, she's at world tour level, winning world tour races, and now repeating a world championship. Definitely, as we said over and over again, discovery process mm. that we're seeing play out in front of our eyes. Yeah, we're seeing more and more. Sorry, go on, Hannah. I was just saying, I quite like what Nathan was saying as opposed to the the crossover of lots of Zwifters going into IRL racing, racing for uh, pro teams or world tour teams, that, that crossover for Los Adachis, perhaps that was her real platform to be able to um, launch herself into into the world tour. She was racing formerly for a, a Dutch club team, mm. was spotted after um, having some strong performances over in Belgium and then of course now races for a world tour team. So I think it also is finding that new talent, a, such a fantastic talent ID program yeah. um, for, for racing on Zwift. Well, she was certainly a name that I was keeping my eye on on the road, having seen how successful she was in the Zwift Racing League. And she's been very successful in both at this point in her career. All right, for one last time, we're going to head back up to that venue in Glasgow to see Manon, uh, who I believe is speaking to Richard Barry. I'll hand you over to her up there now. Wow, what an evening it has been here in Glasgow. But I'm now joined again with Richard. We spoke at the start, but talk us through your race, Richard. How was it? Um, it was pretty good until about 300 meters to go. Um, and look, it was, it was fantastic in front of this crowd, to be honest. Um, but um, like everything went to plan. We followed the plan. Myself and Chris Dawson, who was racing from home, we basically planned for a sprint finish. Um, I kicked where I'd planned to kick, but I probably hesitated about a half a second to her, maybe about a half a second. Um, and I think I was 0.3 of a second outside that top 30 and I think it was 43rd or 44th. Chris had a great ride in that first race, finishing eighth. So at least we had, one of us got through to the second round, but I can't be too disappointed. It, it went quite well. We ex we. We follow the plan. Um, it just didn't quite come off for me in the end, but Chris nailed it, so it was great. It just goes to show how savage this format is. What do you think of it? Do you like it? Are you a fan? I yes, I like from a spectator point of view, it's brilliant. It's like it's just you're in the top 30 and you're out. You're in the top 10 and you're out. You're and then it's it's an elimination rate. It's a great race. It's a great strategy. So it's it's great tactics to follow. There are, it, it's much, much better, I think, than a, a straight up scratch race, much more entertaining um, and definitely a format that should be followed for the future. 
But I have actually really enjoyed being here in the live audience. I mean, I haven't been suffering on the bike, but it has been pretty cool, the atmosphere. And yeah, after your first race, you're out there having a few beers. You've been enjoying it? Yeah, indeed I have. Uh, look, you have to celebrate the occasion as well. It's amazing to be here in Glasgow um, and for eSports e to be celebrated like this. I think this is kind of the kickstart for going into the next next year but then not even only next year the next two or three or four years like tonight is showing what esports can bring to the the cycling table so it's fantastic it definitely is but racing the world championships this weekend we are back to the day job of being a school teacher yes yeah back to teaching uh teaching p on, on monday morning so look it's a uh, it'll keep me grounded anyway and um look it's 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 great to be able to race here at this level um, and it's just look that that day job keeps me grounded they won't care whether i finished 10th 30th 40th whatever um, and hopefully i'll be able to keep on training and come back here next year it'll be fantastic well congratulations and i'll let you go enjoy the rest of the evening and have a few more beers you've deserved it <laughs> but that's it from us in glasgow back to you in the studio Thank you very much, Manon. I think Richard might be secretly quite pleased he went out after round one because it sounds like there's a free <laughs> bar going on up there in Glasgow. I must make sure I'm there this time next year, wherever the <laughs> venue is. Well, we're now going to go over from Richard, who is a teacher, to Zoe Langham, who is, of course, a doctor. She got the silver medal this evening. So huge congratulations to you, Zoe. You must be incredibly pleased, but I guess at the same time a little bit disappointed to be so near to that gold medal in <laughs> rainbow jersey. Oh, not at all, honestly. If, uh, if anyone's been following my Instagram, I came into this week quite unwell, so I was really happy to go on the star line, as I always am, and there was absolutely no mercy out there tonight. <laughs> so everybody did literally so amazing, and every single lady that made it into every race there did absolutely incredibly. The field has seriously stepped up, as it does year after year. And uh, I'm just so proud to be there, so proud of the GB team. We've got the DS behind me. <laughs> this is Adam. I'm sorry to work my camera. <laughs> uh, I've got my family, actually, as well. I'm back here, and my mum and my dad. <laughs> um, so we're, we're absolutely over the moon. I, if you'd asked me what you know, I'd be happy with coming out there, if I made it past the first race, I was ecstatic. So it's been a fantastic night, and I seriously need a... A glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say, you've got your DS there and your family there, but no free bar like Richard seems to have up in Glasgow. I was going to ask you what your expectations were coming into it. You've briefly touched on it there, but what would you have been happy with at the end of today? I genuinely getting past that first race. After that, it was all the, all the kind of, uh, anything was, was good. And um, yeah, every, every, every single time I got through, I was like, oh, that's good enough. Like... We'll just see if we can push a bit further and every sprint got harder but you know that everybody's hurting the same at that point and uh, and yeah you've just never got to give up um i had a lot of support going into this from my outdoor team um, and wahoo call the indoor team um and everyone's just telling me just don't give up don't give up and you know maybe next year i'll slowly work my way up <laughs> <laughs> um third second maybe first <laughs> no but yeah. i'm i'm chuffed i'm over moon I'm really, I'm, I'm chuffed that you're not disappointed at all to have missed out on the gold medal because you did so, so well. Could you have a, or did you have a sense of how strong Lois Adekes was looking whilst you were racing against her this evening? Absolutely, without a doubt. And do you know what? She has done incredibly, hasn't she, this year um, in, life, in real life racing. Uh, she's an absolute inspiration to all of us and I literally couldn't be happier for her. And what are your thoughts in the future? I mean, you've got a very secure, very good job that you worked very hard towards. But when you see what Adekase is achieving out on the road and what her career is becoming, are there any thoughts in your head of maybe I'll give it a go at some point full time? My grand's just messaged me saying, quit your day job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Always listen to your grand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Always listen to your elders. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, there you go, Gran. She'll be li she's listening. She's watching the, uh, the GCN. Um, but yeah, it, yeah, we'll, we'll see. Um, I'm trying to make both things work at the moment, but you never know. Um, I absolutely love cycling, and whenever anyone asks me what I do, I always say cycling. And 
being a doctor just doesn't come into it. <laughs> um, so we'll see, yeah. Yeah, well, we wish you all the best for the future, whichever Thank track you. you decide to go down. Once again, huge congratulations for such a stupendous performance Thanks. and a silver medal today. We will speak to you again very soon. She should be Thank very you pleased. So much. Congrats she to everyone. She Thank should be delighted with that performance, and especially coming into this with a little bit of illness, not feeling great, not knowing what uh, she was able to, to achieve, and coming away with that silver medal and I think it just shows as well her mental fortitude that she would have been happy to get through the first round so she was playing it race by race as opposed to thinking about the final outcome and thinking I want to be world champion get past the first race okay now let's focus on the process of the second race let's focus on the process of each elimination <laughs> of, of that third and final race on the podium and I think the way that the Zoe performed, I, I'm ecstatic for her. Mm -hmm. I, I really am. And you see how she's improved in, in a year. And as she said, if she keeps up that tally from third to silver next year, what could it be? It's yeah. uh, gold. Yeah, well, here's hoping. We'll find out, I guess, in 12 months' time. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to ask both of you your uh, final thoughts on this brand new format on Zwift. But before that, we've already had two rainbow jerseys awarded here this evening for two brand new world champions. Uh, but later on this year in August, we are going to witness the first ever UCI Super World. Over 200 rainbow jerseys are going to be won there in pretty much every cycling discipline that you can imagine. Let's take a look ahead to that. It's going to be an incredible 11 days of competition. And I'm absolutely loving the fact that the road races this year are going to come straight after the Tour de France and Tour de France fam, rather than a little bit later in the year, because I think that's going to open up to far more riders who will be in top form and motivated to compete there. Right then, you two. <laughs> your thoughts on this brand new format. I'll start actually, I, I absolutely loved it because you, know, you can get longer Zwift races where everyone's still quite cagey for a much longer period of time. It all comes down to that sprint towards the end. You couldn't afford to ride like that today, Hannah, could you? You had to go for it at some point three times in a row. You certainly did. And I think it was that uh, coming into it, having that tactic for the first race and knowing you had to put all your eggs into to your basket of to play into your strengths as a rider. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I thought it worked really well. I thought it was, uh, it, it grabbed your attention. It wanted you to, almost to see what was going to happen next, who was going to go out with those elimination style races. I think it was, it was such a close call in, in a lot of the races and, you know, marginal um, gaps between 30th and 31st in that first race. And uh, yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I think it should continue. Nathan? I think what we've found is when you bring esports, and in esports, this is kind of the model in esports. You have these tournaments, knockouts, you have situations where it's a rinse and repeat of very high pressure situations that people have to make it through, and then someone's eliminated, usually a round robin type tournament situation or something like that. And it's that, are they going to make it? That, like, are they going to put the gamble out there? And the viewers sitting there and following along with that and kind of riding their coattails along if they're going to make it and then rinse and repeat that, it brings the elation up and back down and back up all the way until you hit that final spot of we found our champion. Mm -hmm. Esports does that really well, and I think we're bringing that to cycling now, and they're meeting in a great synergy for this. Yeah, one person I know is a big fan of this new format is Matt Stevens because it made his job of calling the finish a whole lot easier, isn't it? You've got three <laughs> riders to think of rather than a peloton of around a hundred. Uh, right, we are just about to wrap things up. We'd like to know your thoughts on this brand new format as well. You can leave them in the comments section just down below this video. Uh, did you love it? Would you change something slightly? You can let us know all the details there. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much to our guests today, Hannah Walker and Nathan Guerra. Thanks to Matt Stevens as well uh, for bringing us the commentaries for our all six rounds. And of course, a huge congratulations to Bjorn Andreasen and Lewis Haddekeist who've become the 2023 UCI Cycling Esports world champions. Loads more cycling to come on GCN Plus, including those world championships in Glasgow later on this year in August. Uh, we'll see you very shortly, but for now, from all of us, it's goodbye.